Marvin Heemeyer, an American welder, a Colorado muffler mogul, a man who decided to modify a Komatsu D355A bulldozer into a demolition weapon and then go on a two-plus-hour rampage in the small town of Granby, Colorado in 2004, destroying the town's concrete plant, town hall, local newspaper office, hardware store, and much more. He shot at local police, shot at a local enemy, tried to blow up some propane tanks, and then he shot himself. Why? Because the city decided to allow a concrete plant to be built next to his muffler repair business. But is the story really that simple? Of course not. The story of Marvin Heemeyer and his killdozer may be one of the most misunderstood stories on the internet today, and I'm so glad we're covering it this week. It plays out like some kind of backwoods Shakespearean tragedy set 20 years ago in the mountains of Colorado. The internet seems to have come to one general consensus regarding who Marvin Heemeyer was, and I have come to another. The web has anointed Marvin as some kind of anti-government hero, a blue-collar David who fought a governmental Goliath and won, kind of. But is that true? Maybe not. Let's dig down past myth building and get to some truth in today's Did That Guy Really Attack a Town with a Heavily Modified Bulldozer Over a Fucking Zoning Issue edition of Time Suck. This is Michael McDonald and you're listening to Time Suck. (laughs) You're listening to Time Suck. Happy Monday, Meat Sacks. Welcome to the Cult of the Curious. Hail Nimrod. Stick around, Lucifina. Praise Bojangles and glory be to Triple M. Hope y'all got to spend time with family, biological and or chosen over the past few days. Hope you got to eat some good food. Hoping you're enjoying the beginning of the holiday season. Uh, Looking forward to seeing some of you this weekend in Tacoma. Lindsay will be coming with me, the queen of the suck. Stand-up shows at the Tacoma Comedy Club this Thursday through Saturday. Live Ant Hill Kids podcast uh, also on Saturday. And then I'll be in Spokane, Washington right after Christmas, December 26th to 28th, and that's it for 2019. And then I'll announce a bunch of 2020 dates soon. Uh, doing something a little different for the holidays this month concerning our monthly charity donation. Still figuring it all out. I'm uh, going to announce it next week, but it does include adopting a family from within the cult of the curious. Going to give them the Christmas they otherwise would not get, and maybe more than one family will get this. I'll have more details next week. Uh, big Cyber Monday deal in Time Suck uh, at this, in the Shopify store for a few more hours if you're listening to this today when the episode drops. Colt Robes back in stock. Almost sold out again. Just a couple left. Also, an amazing new Christmas sweater is in the store. You finally got a Christmas sweater. Oh, my heck, it's glorious. All I want for Christmas is Bojangles, navy blue, 100% cotton, 1,000% one-eyed, three-legged pit bull ball sack. Toughest substance known to man. Also super soft, luxurious. Get it. Stay safe. Stay Stay warm. Stay inside Bojangles, sweet, sweet sack, uh, with this Bojangles sweater. Uh, and now for a special edition type of episode today. We're, we're getting right to it. We're getting, we're getting right into it. Uh, thrown in a 30-minute interview with Glenn Trainer, one of the local law enforcement agents who tried to stop Marvin Hemeyer's Killdozer Rampage back in 2004. That'll be towards the end of this suck. A lot of other info to get to first, so let's get to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Allow me to paint the setting before we really dive in today's, uh, into today's story details. This part is oftentimes my favorite part of the research. I love an excuse to dig into some little pocket of the U.S. or, or the world uh, that I would otherwise, you know, uh, never learn about, perhaps not even think about. Today's suck takes place entirely, at least all of the dramatic events take place entirely, inside of Grand County, Colorado. Very rural county in north central Colorado, just under 1,900 square miles in size. The county seat is Hot Sulphur Springs. Little town of about 700 people. It's over a two and a half hour drive from Denver and over a three hour drive to Loveland. 11 different heavily forested national protected areas reside at least partly inside county lines, such as the majestic Rocky Mountain National Park, a park of almost 415 square miles that encompasses the headwaters of the mighty Colorado River. One of the most often visited parks of the U.S. National Park System, a park loaded with moose and elk and other wildlife, a park flush with snow capped rugged peaks and a vast sea of old growth pine. Wouldn't change a single thing about it. Epic. Three out of five stars. Uh, it's an extremely scenic, picturesque county full of alpine, pristine lakes, rivers, and a fair amount of second homes. Not a, not a lot of year-round residents. An area full of a lot more deer than people. 
The town of Granby is the most populated town in the county, and it has less than 2,000 people in it. If you're looking for shopping malls and 14-screen cineplexes and a big nightlife scene or even a variety of fast food options, Grand County is not for you. Since the town of Granby is the small town location where Marvin Hemeyer's dispute occurred, and the town that has killed or rampaged within, let's talk a bit about this little alpine burg of about 1,900 year-round residents. Granby, like the rest of this mountainous county, sits high, high above sea level, almost 8,000 feet above sea level, over a mile and a half above sea level. Not the ideal place to kick off your new commitment to CrossFit if you're a bit out of shape. Great place to get hammered drunk if you can only afford to buy two or three drinks. High altitude, hard on cardio, helpful when it comes to getting inebriated. Uh, you can take an Amtrak train to Granby, uh, which is rare for a town so small. The California Zephyr passenger train, which heads back and forth between Chicago and San Francisco, stops in Granby. Granby also has a small airport where you can charter uh, a flight in and out of if you have the money, a little private flight, or you can uh, fly in your own small plane if you have a pilot's license. The area gets a lot of snow, like a lot, between 20 to 40 inches of snow a month all winter long. Cross-country skiing, down, downhill skiing, uh, snowshoeing, snowmobiling, all very popular local activities. Huge snowmobile area. Uh, skinny dipping and sunbathing, wearing capri pants, drinking Mai Tais in January. Not a popular local activity. Very outdoorsy in Granby. Here's a little description taken from Grand County's uh, visitor's website. Granby, <laughs> Granby is brimming with exciting activities to enjoy all summer long, like hiking, camping, world-class golfing, mountain biking, boating, rafting, horseback riding, hunting, gold medal waters, and trophy lake fishing on any of the lakes surrounding Granby. During the winter, Granby is not short of things to do either. Go skiing at Granby Ranch, tear it up on a snowmobile, go ice fishing, dog sledding, or take in all the beauty around you on a snowshoeing trail. Granby has something for everyone to do year-round. And, and by everyone, they mean everyone who loves to do nothing but outdoorsy shit. If you love the energy of a city, if you like being able to eat three different meals from three different really good ethnic restaurants a day, if you love art museums, architecture, high fashion, first-run movies, even laser tag, if you like late-night coffee shops with high-speed Wi-Fi or even a giant bookstore, Granby is a fucking nightmare. Uh, and then there's the nearby town of Grand Lake, Colorado, closer to where Hemeyer actually lived, just 15 miles away. The Rocky Mountain National Park surrounds this little town on three sides, a town built along the shores of the actual lake of Grand Lake. Colorado's largest and deepest natural lake, a lake that is part of the headwaters of the Colorado River, the most important river as far as agriculture goes, in the very important agricultural area of the southwestern United States. Uh, Grand Lake is a resort town. Even though less than 500 people live here year-round, they still have a summer stock theater company that produces three Broadway musicals from June through August and another musical in September, performing in a modern 12,000-square-foot theater complex. Lots of summer tourists, lots of summer weekend residents. The whole area reads to me as a place full of a ton of stereotypical rich white people shit. An area that probably sells a lot of overpriced, new age jewelry, landscape, still life paintings. Not that there's anything wrong with that. Save your emails. I'm not denigrating local craftsmen and artists. Just setting the scene. I've been to so many of these towns. The area has a lot of resorts that I imagine sell a lot of massage and spa type packages. An area built around a lot of tourism. Very, very hoity-toity. Can we use that word? An area full of a lot of hunting and fishing and kayaking guides and ski instructors and jet ski rentals, all that shit. Not a, like, not a, uh, a lot unlike my current home base of Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, but, but more remote and more mountainous. I picture a more upscale version of where I grew up in central Idaho. You know, in a place like this, there's going to be townies, and then there's going to be tourists. There's going to be a fairly distinct social divide between the two. Growing up in an area uh, like this, um, you know, and, and, and with the tourists, actually, uh, I should say townies and then tourists and also just kind of out of town, towners, like outsiders, people who didn't grow up there. That's the divide. There's the, there's the locals that have been there for multiple generations and everybody else, you know, growing up in an area kind of like this. I, I just know that there's a lot of, uh, or some, I should say, I shouldn't say a lot, but you know, some locals who take a lot of pride in their families having lived in an area for multiple generations, right? Take a lot of pride in not being tourists or outsiders not being a part of, of a recent wave of transplants. Uh, my family has lived in Riggins, Idaho for many generations. So even though I rarely come back and interact with the town in any kind of meaningful way, amongst the older generations, I will forever be a local. They knew me as a child, as Danny Cummins, son of Charlene, grandson of Warden Betty, and they knew my, my mom, you know, know my grandparents. They, they knew my great-grandparents. If they're old enough, they may have even know my great-great-grandparents. And that matters to some locals. To some, it matters a whole bunch. 
The more tourism and the more tourists there are, the more people from out of town move in, the more it matters. A real us versus them attitude becomes entrenched in the local consciousness. The tourists are perceived correctly or incorrectly to have a we think we're better than you kind of attitude. The comparatively rich city people come in, buy second homes, take over a lot of the best lots. There, there develops a bit of fear over outsiders coming in and just kind of making the town and their image, taking it from the locals. Similar to a lot of the uh, fear certain people have regarding immigration in general, right? A fear of people coming in and turning ours into theirs. A fear as old as humanity itself. Outsiders moving in who don't care that so-and-so took the football team to, to state 25 years ago or that such-and-such such was a runner-up in a state beauty pageant 30 years ago or that what's-his-name was written about in Field and Stream 10 years ago, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Outsiders who don't care about local culture. Feathers can easily get ruffled in a place like this. Egos can easily get bruised. There's a great show on Amazon Prime produced for the Paramount Network starring Kevin Cosner, Luke Grimes, and Kelly Riley, uh, surrounded by a fantastic cast and great writers that deals with the divide between outsiders and longstanding locals very well, called Yellowstone. Not a sponsor. I just feel like this show, I, I'm a big fan, and uh, I feel like it kind of relates to this episode. It's set in Bozeman, Montana. One of my favorite shows in years. Three out of five stars. Uh, no, but there's this sense of us versus them in, in a place like this, and, it, and I'm sure in Grand County. Uh, California was perhaps the dirtiest four-letter word uh, I, I, I heard growing up, right? A lot of talk about the goddamn Californians coming in, throwing their money around, taking over the whole town, buying up all the land, kicking the locals off of it. Can't hunt on, can't hunt on these acres anymore because some rich asshole from San Diego bought it from the Goslings and turned their ranch into their own private game reserve. Can't fish over on the Anderson's old place because some asshole from Monterey bought it for their summer home. Remember the Stowers old place down the lake? Well, now we don't get to fish there. Now it belongs to some lawyer from Los Angeles. And he put no trespassing signs all over the goddamn place. A lot of that kind of talk. I think understanding this sense of local versus outsider, very important to understanding the Killdozer story. Because this type of shit, again, for sure went on where our story took place. Uh, even on Grand Granby's Wikipedia page, it says, many Granby and Grand County residents are descended from pioneer settlers who arrived before the country was fully surveyed. Early families established themselves under the Homestead Act of 1862, which allowed easy access to land to those who would inhabit and improve upon the territory. Clearly, having roots in the area matters. Marvin Hemeyer did not have roots in the area. He did not grow up there. And if you don't grow up there, then goddamn it, you're not a local. Forever and ever, amen. Case closed. Marvin moved in the area uh, later in life. He would always be an outsider. And he made a really bad first impression with some of the locals by pulling what, what seems like some, some kind of greedy business moves. We'll get to in a bit. Moves that would be okay in a city. But coming from a small town, what he did was just not fucking kosher. Uh, and these business moves spiraled out into a, kind of a revenge fantasy of ec epic proportions that Marvin actually carried out following, quote unquote, God's will. Uh, we'll get into that later as well. So let's keep all this in mind. As we look into Marvin's move into the area, and the infamous zoning dispute and other details that led to a man deciding to go on a fortified bulldozer suicide mission in today's Time Suck timeline. But before we get into that, time for a quick sponsor. Time Suck is brought to you today by Four Hymns. Do you like gummies? Do you like tasty, vitamin-packed gummies? If you don't, you should. If you think you don't, I bet you haven't had uh, Hymns, Heart, Immunity, or Multivitamin Gummies. Get that biotin. Get that vitamin D. Get those uh, phytosterols. To make your heart feel loved and cared for. And get it all in gummy form that makes you feel like you're having some kind of breakfast dessert instead of taking nasty old vitamins. Uh, also, you can get some discreet sexual plumbing help if you need that as well. 40% of men by age 40 struggle from not being able to get and maintain an erection. But the good news is the holiday season is upon us and you can get a free online visit to get started with hymns and work on rectifying that erection situation. Hims connects you with real licensed doctors, FDA approved pharmaceutical products to treat ED. They offer a well known generic equivalent, excuse me, equivalents to name brand prescriptions and answer all your questions in a confidential chat with their doctors. Your holiday candle just found its match. Try Hims today by starting out with a free online visit. Go to forhims.com slash time suck ED. That's F O R H I M S dot com slash time suck ED. Forhims.com slash Time suck ED. Uh, prescription products are subject to doctor approval and require an online cons consultation with the physician who will determine if a prescription is appropriate. See website for full details and safety information. This could cost hundreds if you went in person to the doctor's office or pharmacy. Remember, that's forhims.com slash time suck ED. Now, please allow me to hit that time suck timeline a button. 
Strap on those boots, soldier. We're marching down a time suck timeline. Not a lot of details or public knowledge in regards to Marvin Heemeyer's childhood, so apologies for the front half of this timeline being a little, a little skimpy on the kid deets. Uh, here's what we could find. On October 28, 1951, Marvin John Heemeyer was born in Castlewood, South Dakota, also a tiny town, just around 600 people, so he knew all about small town life. His parents and were Father John and Mother Augusta. He had three siblings, Ken, Donald, McRonald, and Kathy. And of course, I added McRonald to Donald. Could, could one person please name their kid Donald McRonald? It would make me so happy for reasons that aren't entirely clear to myself. Uh, bonus points if, you're, if your last name is McDonald. Donald McRonald McDonald. Maybe the most glorious name that ever could be. Uh, anyway, uh, both of Marvin's parents were very religious, very Christian, as Marvin would prove to be throughout his life. Uh, this also plays heavily into today's conflict. Marvin had a, had a pretty rigid, rigid moral code that included an Old Testament sense of vengeance. Uh, while Marvin was growing up, John and Augusta were busy volunteering with their church. John made a comfortable living in real estate and farming. As a kid, Marvin struggled in school, like really struggled. Uh, I believe actually that an intellectual inability to problem solve when it came to complex problems may have, may have also contributed to Marvin's dramatic final showdown with the town of Granby. Maybe not, but possibly. I'm not convinced his thinking noodle was always operating at uh, max capacity. Marvin would remember a teacher telling him that he'd never amount to anything and that other teachers repeated that sentiment. I imagine that gave him a bit of a chip on his shoulder. I also imagine that if multiple teachers are telling you this, that you might be part of the problem. Whenever somebody has a story that includes a lot of, and then this person was mean to me, and then this other person was mean to me, and then I couldn't get ahead here because this person tried to help me back, and then and this other person, man, they had it out for me. I always think the same thing. What is the one common denominator in all these interactions? You. You are at least part of the problem. Uh, which I which I wish I knew why that mul multiple teachers expressed a you'll never amount to anything sentiment about Marvin. Uh, I'm guessing maybe caused some problems in the classroom. I don't know. Uh, Marvin graduated 28 out of 29 in his class. Uh, ouch. This is why I think he may have had some intellectual issues. When you graduate at the bottom of a class in a small town public school, odds are you're either not trying because you don't care about school or you genuinely have trouble learning due to some type of intellectual impairment or learning disability. Small town public schools are generally uh, not known to be academically rigorous and ultra competitive. This was not a collegiate prep school. This was a small town South Dakota school. Uh, Marvin didn't apply for or plan to attend college when he graduated. He really didn't know what to do with himself. Investigators speculate that this is what compelled him to go into the Air Force. A combination of a lack of career options and also, to be fair to Marvin, the desire to try and do something useful for his country and for himself. And in that sense, I definitely applaud this guy. A lot of people don't make that choice. A lot of kids I went to school with struggled, also didn't know what to do with themselves, chose to aimlessly party, bounce from odd job to odd job after school. And I can say that over 20 years after leaving high school, that generally doesn't lead to a fulfilling and meaningful life. It generally isn't a great look later. Life successful by any measurement standard leads to a lot of uh, becoming, frankly, uh, you know, for, for many people, a life of sadness and becoming kind of a burden on society. So good for Marvin for, you know, just uh, doing something, doing something great, actually. Uh, last note about Marvin's childhood throughout his years of poor grades and teachers being hard on him and obviously having problems with him. Uh, Marvin's mother, Augusta, continuously reminded him that God has laid out plans for each of our lives well in advance of our living them. And he has a special plan laid out for all of us, including Marvin. And all Marvin had to do was work hard, try to do his best, treat people with kindness, and he would find his way to that plan's end. And that's a great message for 90% of people. But if you're mentally unstable, become temporarily cognitively unhinged, that message can get twisted into something really awful. And Martin, as you will find out later, for sure twisted this message of, you know, being part of God's plan into something terrible. In late 1969, yeah, uh, 1969, just turned 18-year-old Marvin goes into the Air Force. He's stationed at uh, Lowry Air Force Base in Denver for a time, which would lead to him moving to Colorado. He explored some of the wilderness around Denver, fell in love with Grand County. I get it. Looking at the pictures, it is gorgeous. At the end of his service, Marvin is stationed in Germany. And in the late 70s, he's honorably discharged after an eight-year stint. After leaving the Air Force, Marvin immediately goes to work at one of Scotty's Muffler Shops in Denver, a local muffler chain. There are several Scotty's Muffler Shops around the U.S., such as in San Bernardino, California, and Macon, Georgia, but they don't seem to uh, belong to the same Scotty. There have apparently been a variety of Scotty's working on a variety of mufflers around the U.S. Fucking Scotty's, man. <laughs> Classic Scotty being Scotty. If there's one thing I know about Scotty's, 
is that some of them are good at fixing mufflers. I've always said that, or I've never said that. I forget. Uh, Marvin was a great mechanic. He liked to work with his hands. He liked his type of work so much and saw so much opportunity in it as a business that he and a coworker, Cliff Udy, bought one of Denver's popular Scotty muff, uh, Scotty's muffler locations for 10 grand in 1978. As Marvin tells it, just after paying the franchise fee, the franchise went bankrupt. Damn it! That would suck. That's bad news. Can you imagine buying a McDonald's and then uh, McDonald's headquarters suddenly like, yeah, hey, uh, bad news, we're done. <laughs> Sorry. Here's a PDF of all of our recipes. Best of luck making those McMuffins and McFlurries. Just, no! What am I supposed to do with all these signs? I got this big golden arches sign. What am I supposed to do with this Christmas clown costume? What am I supposed to do with this small man I befriended specifically so he could dress up and be a convincing hamburglar? Come on! God damn you, Donald Ronald McDonald! Uh, please don't, please don't fact check any of that about, uh, Donald, uh, McRonald McDonald being the founder of McDonald's. Uh, there was some good news, uh, though as well. Marvin and Udy inherited three other Scotty shops in Denver for next to nothing when the franchise went down. It was a take over the debt and it's yours to run kind of deal. But there was also some more bad news. Local shops were in debt to suppliers to the tune of roughly $10,000. Hard enough to turn one location around into something profitable. To turn four around would prove to be a lot harder. Marvin and Udy decided to try to salvage the business by raising another 10 grand each, right? Pay off some suppliers, you know, buy some more supplies, get things kind of running again. Uh, Udy borrows his portion from some relatives, but Marvin couldn't raise his portion. He didn't have anybody to borrow from, uh, possibly because he'd paid the bulk of the initial $10,000. And so he, uh, he tried to raise the additional funds by using his mechanic and welding skills to convert bulldozers into killdozers in Denver's underground killdozer market. Denver's been a hot spot for killdozers for a number of years. Denver's long had a large uh, Kazakh population. If there's one thing Kazakhs are famous for, it's, it's for turning earth-moving equipment into weapons. There's, a, there's an old saying back in Kazakhstan, and it's, if you can build something, we can put guns on it and make it bulletproof. And that's, that's not true. But it would be great to dig further into that if it were true. Uh, Kazakhstan is actually mostly known for being the world's largest landlocked country at over a million square miles, also for being the probable birthplace of apples and also where humans probably first tamed wild horses. And none of that shit has anything to do with today's story, so I'll refocus. Uh, Hemeyer didn't have the other $10,000 to invest in the struggling muffler partnership. And according to his old partner, Cliff Udy, Marvin tried to steal Cliff's $10,000. Who knows if that's true? There's no extra details about you know, why he thought that. Marvin is no longer alive to tell his side of the story. Uh, what is for sure true is that the new business owners almost immediately have a falling out and it leads to the disillusion of their partnership. The two decide to part ways. They sell two of the four shops they had just been handed. Uh, then each of the men takes over one of the two remaining shops. Udy remains in debt and eventually has to declare bankruptcy on his shop. Marvin, however, makes a go of his muffler shop which he eventually sells only to open another muffler repair shop in the city of Boulder. Uh, 1980, when he's 28 years old. Now, Boulder's just outside of Denver to the northwest, less than 30 miles from downtown Denver. Hemeyer, good with his hands when it came to mufflers, maybe better with his head when it came to running muffler shops. Between 1980, when Marvin opened his own shop in Boulder, and 1991, he opened, managed, leased, and sold a shop in the uh, Denver area suburbs and cities of Commerce City, Aurora, Inglewood, and Lakewood. So he's, uh, you know, doing pretty well with the muffler, muffler business. He builds a positive reputation across a number of towns as an expert on mufflers. He makes a very good living. Uh, he was called the muffler man by some locals, but not all of his endeavors worked out. Uh, this real estate wheeler and dealer also lost his ass a few times in the mid-80s. Marvin ventured about 150 miles west to Denver and lost $57,000 in Toponis, Colorado, the result of a bad land deal and perhaps even an outright scam perpetrated against him in the little unincorporated gas station and post office perpetrating as an actual town of only about 50 people. And, uh, and, I, and I based my pronunciation of Toponis, by the way, on one YouTube video of an older woman describing the lone uh, store slash gas station there. According to her, it has a little bit of everything, including liquor. So, you know, you get a chance to check it out. All right, and here's what happened to Marvin, Marvin in uh, Toponis. The Route County Commissioner in Topo, uh, uh, Toponis was a man named Den Vistanainer, uh, something like that. He's, you know, this is not a lot of YouTube videos about uh, Dean uh, Vicentainer. Maybe is how you say his name. He was also a real estate agent. He sold mortgages to dozens, if not hundreds of people, people who invest in 40-acre parcels of land 
uh, that were to be developed by a regional corporation. Marvin was one of these investors. Right after investing, the regional corporation that sold the land went bankrupt and the deal fell through. Marvin didn't get his money back. Marvin and several others filed grievances against the corporation and this uh, realtor whom they felt had scammed them. And he consulted a lawyer about bringing a lawsuit against them. We didn't realize it was a legal scam, Marvin said. Marvin was told he could spend another $30,000 retaining the lawyer, insisting on a lawsuit, but was also told by this lawyer that they had no real chance of winning their case. And the, and the odds of getting uh, you know, the original money back was very, very, very low. So he just ended up eating that money, you know, a, a sizable amount of money. Um, he ended up eating, oh, I, I don't think I mentioned it for whatever reason. Initially, he ended up eating uh, $57,000 is how much he lost on this particular deal. So he would leave this experience feeling as if he was, you know, fucked over by his local small town bureaucrat, and perhaps he was. And this would not be the last time he would feel this way. And I'm sure this memory fueled a desire to fight the man, the powers that be, the next time he felt like he was getting screwed over by the system. Another financial misstep came when Marvin was, quote, talked into buying an apartment complex in Boulder from a real estate agent Marvin knew because they both attended the same Christian Reformed church. This one might have been a good investment, perhaps was simply mishandled. Working with the rental isn't the same as working with mufflers. Or maybe it was just a shitty investment. For whatever reason, the apartment complex ended up being uh, foreclosed on. Luckily, throughout all of this, Marvin's muffler shops are kicking ass. Still making some good muffler money. Still making that smog scratch. Still making those exhaust system shekels. I'll stop now. In the fall of 1990, Marvin is approached by one of his workers, one of his employees, Doug Brandstetter about leasing his Boulder muffler shop. Marvin was a little nervous about letting go of his main cash cow, but the now 38-year-old mechanic and welder eventually agreed to do it. He and Brand Center worked out a monthly payment rate that provided a nice chunk of change for Marvin every month that was essentially passive income. Doug now would do all the muffler work. Uh, Marvin wouldn't even have to show up, and he would just be written a check every month. Pretty sweet deal. Not even 40 years old. Marvin is now essentially retired. He'd never gotten married, never had kids. He'd lived frugally. Outside of that bad uh, toe bonus deal and that apartment complex failure, he'd done very well for himself. And now he had more than enough money to live on, uh, you know, coming in every month. He didn't have to install or repair any mufflers to get it. So Marvin hangs around his house for a while, fixes some stuff, has breakfast and beers with friends, gets bored, doesn't know what to do with all his free time. Uh, I do find it curious that he doesn't use this time to form any kind of meaningful romantic relationship. He apparently was straight. At least one relationship uh, is briefly referenced in everything I've read about him, you know, towards the end, as we'll find out uh, before his father dies later on. I think I forgot to put it in the notes at that point in the story, but there was like one source that mentions, uh, you know, his possible even fiance breaking up, but then it's never brought up again. I don't know. There's very, very, very little mentioned about any kind of romantic relationships with this guy and uh, nothing that we could find at least. I mean, maybe he's a small business owner. He didn't have much time to date, maybe, but I doubt it. Uh, and also, like, why wouldn't he start dating now? I mean, why wouldn't it be mentioned in anything, you know, written about him? This guy's always going to church. Uh, that is mentioned. You know, he's a weekly church goer. And, and I do know from having Christian friends and being surrounded by Christian culture that if you're like a, a young, single Christian man, especially one doing well for himself, hard worker, man who works with his hands, built up a blue collar business into a, a nice success story, a veteran, for fuck's sake. You are some top shelf Christian marriage material, right? Loves Christian God, check. Loves Christian country, check. Goes to church regularly, check. Makes a great living, all the boxes are checked. I mean, what else do you want? Uh, I mean, I, I don't know if I'd call him a looker, but Marvin didn't appear to be unattractive. You know, he was fit. It looked like he put some effort into wearing clean clothes, combing his hair, had a decent smile, but no marriage, no sowing of those seeds. Why is that? I don't know, but it could speak to some communication issues, to some mental issues to some degree of being unwilling to compromise. Isn't that what committed relationships are all about? Communication, compromise. I'm speculating here, pulling this out of my ass, but a lack of any relationship being mentioned does give me a little moment of, huh, huh, okay, that's interesting. So I thought I'd share it. Uh, in the winter of 1990, Marvin, the perennial Christian bachelor, goes snowmobiling with a friend named John Kleiner, a guy he'd done a lot of exhaust and muffler work for in partnership with Kleiner's business, Dr. John's Auto Care. This is the only uh, real kind of friend that gets mentioned in today's story, again, uh, or also, by the way, talking about relationships. And, you know, this friend was, you know, this friendship came basically through like business wheelings and dealings. And then this friendship will go away later. So also kind of like, huh. Uh, these guys loaded up their snowmobiles. Kleiner drove them to the snowmobiling capital of Colorado, Grand Lake. 
you know, that town we, uh, we just talked about back in uh, Grand County, the town you're introduced to earlier. They'd never come up there before, or I guess, uh, uh, I'm sorry, um, uh, Marvin had never come up there before. Kleiner told Marvin he'd recently bought a cabin in Granby, you know, the other town we talked about. Uh, I, sh- I should reintroduce the- this area now, add a few more details. The Colorado Alpine towns of Grand Lake, Granby, Hot Sulphur Springs, Winter Park, all within a short drive from one another. A resident of one town would often work in another town, go to eat in another town, go grocery shopping and still another town. And, you know, they all kind of worked in conjunction with one another. Uh, Winter Park attracted tourists for its skiing, Grand Lake for fishing, boating, snowmobiling, Hot Sulphur Springs, county seat. That's where the 14th Judicial Courthouse was located in Granby with its greater Granby Chamber of Commerce was the economic hub where people from these towns and a few other surrounding small communities would buy their groceries, building supplies, other general goods. Each of these towns has a board of trustees, a mayor, and a town council who are elected but don't receive payment, or at least didn't at that time. Uh, They would serve as volunteers. That's an important detail to remember. Volunteer local government, not serious politicians, not big bureaucracy. Uh, Martin, a lifelong staunch conservative, immediately interested in in this area. He loved the small local government concept. He loved the socially conservative local culture. Boulder is pretty liberal. And it wasn't long after returning to Boulder, after, you know, checking out this area with his buddy, that Marvin decided he wanted to go back to Ground County, and this time for a six-month-long vacation. He would later claim that he justified this vacation because he was certain that Doug Brandstetter would eventually default on his lease. And then Marvin would have to go back and run his muffler business again. And he thought, you know, why not enjoy myself for a little while 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 I do have this money coming in, while I don't have to go work for it. So in the fall of 1991, Marvin rents a condo in Grand Lake, goes uh, snowmobiling a a whole bunch, meets some of the locals, apparently tries to fuck none of them. What is going on there? He has time to snowmobile, but not time to try and get that possibly virgin wean, little little alpine action. Get get that dry wean baptized, one of Granby's Lady Hot Springs. What's going on there? Reads as abnormal to me. How did Lucifina have no hold over him? Girls girls are so fun. Uh, But I do understand some people love the single life, right? The celibate single life. I guess I'll try and stop beating that drum. Also, in the fall of 1991, Marvin starts a local beef that would last for years with a local newspaper journalist. He read the daily issue of the local Sky High newspaper one morning, Granby's newspaper, and he he got fired the flip up. The paper had printed a series of articles focused on gambling, which the nearby counties of Teller and Gilpin had recently legalized and been capitalizing on. And the paper pondered, at what overall socioeconomic cost had these economic surges come? Their editorial answer was at the cost of human life, decency, and civilized society. And Marvin thought that answer was bullshit. Pissed him right to flip and fuck off. Uh, These articles conceded that while legalized gambling, which was now being brought up regularly at county commission and board of trustees meetings in Grand County, typically jump-started an economy, it almost always was accompanied by an uh, an increase in violence, robbery, murder, alcoholism, and drug use. The paper's editor, Patrick Brower, voiced his opposition to legalized gambling coming to Grand County, going so far as to name proponents of the issue in Granby and condemning their ideas and calling them ignorant, fools, and other such terms. And Marvin thought, well, fucking flip Patrick then. Flip that mother father straight to heck. Gosh dang. Uh, Marvin read the letter a bunch of times and set about writing an angry but not unhinged letter of his own. His letter was published later that week and spoke directly to Brower in response to his earlier editorial. It read, this is America. And you are entitled to your free speech and to write what you want in the press. But I don't think you need to call out specific individuals and publicly shame them because you disagree with their viewpoints. They may not have your gift for writing and they may not have your power of the press, but they are still entitled to their opinions, Mr. Brower. And you should respect them as both people and as readers. All right. So this guy, you know, he's got strong opinions. Not afraid of a little confrontation. Not afraid to speak his mind. Later that night, Marvin claims his door was knocked on by downstairs neighbor Mayo Butch Sommermeyer a lawyer out of Fort Collins. They'd never really talked to one another before. And he says their conversation went something like this. Hey, Marv, just got done reading your letter in the newspaper. Just wanted to say, I I thought you hit it right on the head. Oh, thanks. I I ain't no writer, but when I read that Patrick Brower's guy letter the other day, I just, I got mad. Yeah, well, you nailed his ass to the wall, as far as I'm concerned. He thinks he's this kind of big newspaper kingpin, mover and shaker in the county, has has a county and the board under his thumb. But he's just their pawn, spineless, wouldn't say a mean thing to your face, just writes it to embarrass you, embarrass the whole county. And that's just how the conversation went down, apparently. Uh, and if that's, if that is how it went down, then Butch Sommermeyer is a fucking halfwit. <laughs> Marv, Marv did not nail Patrick's ass to the wall. 
Uh, Patrick Brower didn't think he had the county under his thumb because if that were true, he just wouldn't have published Marvin's letter. Clearly, as the editor, he thought that Marvin wrote a nice piece, you know, showing a contrasting opinion to his own, so he published it. If he was some kind of power-hungry media dictator, he just wouldn't publish any dissenting opinions. Dude had no legal obligation to give Marvin the time of day. If anything, him publishing it speaks to him being a solid journalist who kept his ego in check and tried to print a balanced publication. So good for him. At least that's what I think. I don't know, Patrick. I don't know any of these guys. Uh, throughout the rest of the year in 1992, when the gambling issue in Grand County came to a head and was voted upon in Grand Lake and was mostly opposed, Marvin wrote more angry response letters to various anti-gambling articles printed in the newspaper, both by Brower and by another staff writer named C.C. Cruson. And they did publish some of these letters as well. And Marvin apparently hated these damn liberal media liars with their, with their agendas. How dare they have opinions different than his own and print them in their own paper in an editorial section to place four opinions. Uh, long before the infamous zoning dispute that would send Mar- uh, Marvin into full killdozer mode, he'd already made some enemies. And again, you know, just shows that he is, he is not afraid to kind of, you know, get in somebody's shit if he disagrees with them. As the months pass by, Brandstetter's payments continue to get sent in, uh, in full, sweet muffler moolah. And by February of 1992, Marvin starts to think that maybe, just maybe, this Brandstetter fella isn't too bad at running a muffler shop. Maybe this is going to be a, a nice continuing deal for him. So then Marvin thought, well, what am I supposed to do with the rest of my life now? You know, he didn't want to move back to Boulder. He had taken to small town life. He liked the area. So he just decided to stay. And he contacted a local realtor about buying some property. In March of 92, the realtor showed Marvin some land located about 10 miles northwest of Granby along Highway 125, diverging east along County Road 406 for two miles, not far from the municipality of Grand Lake, Colorado. There were two parcels of land for sale, a lot of land, 27 acres in total. Uh, portions of the gold run stream running through it, two cabins in disrepair on it. And he got it for the steal of a price of $109,500. No doubt attracted by the view, the, seclu- uh, the seclusion, the cheap price, as much as the opportunity to repair the cabins and maintain the land. Marvin buys it. He would then uh, keep himself busy fixing fences and working the property for the next six plus months. Dude was living the dream. Holy shit. Living in God's country, as so many call it, the great outdoors, living on 27 super scenic, pristine acres with a beautiful stream running through the land known to be excellent for fly fishing, a stream full of fat-ass trout, living in an outdoorsman's paradise and young enough to really, truly be able to get outside and enjoy it. And then it looked like things were going to get even better for Marvin. A new business opportunity opens up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hail Nimrod, praise be to Lucifina, even though her charms had apparently no effect, uh, no effect. On a, on a dick that seemed to have been used even less than Chikatilo's. Why you do this? Why you needless throw Ukrainian soft shame cock into kill those or suck? What is big deal? You childlike asshole. Almost impotent serial killer has nothing to do with today's tale. Please stop I embarrassed for you. Tell fucking story, you American simpleton. <laughs> oh, oh my, sold by Chikatilo. I've, I've sunk to a new low. Uh, let's talk about Marv's new business opportunity. In April of 1992, knowing about Marvin's move to Grand County's old buddy, his old snowmobile and friend, John Kleiner, that son of a bitch he'd done a lot of exhaust and muffler work for back in Boulder in partnership with Kleiner's business, Dr. John's Auto Care. Oh, I bet they had some fun jingles. Get your car to Dr. John's Auto Care. You won't have any worries if you go to Dr. John's just with the doctor. I don't know. Fucking something, something horrible. Uh, after hearing about how much fun Marvin was having living in the area full time, Kleiner wanted to move to Granby and live there full time as well. He wanted to open up a new garage live his best life up there in the mountains. So John asked Marvin if Marvin could suck his dick. He promised he wouldn't tell anyone. He told a conservative, you know, Marvin, uh, that it wasn't even that gay if Marvin kept his eyes closed the whole time and thought about women. Uh, wait, what? No, that's not right. Sorry, I was looking at the wrong notes. J- JK. <laughs> uh, John asked Marvin if he could look around for a suitable location for an auto body garage, and Marvin agreed. Yeah, that's okay. That's what I meant to say. Uh, he might called another realtor. Jeff Crane told him what he was looking for. Jeff showed him a lot in East Granby off of Agate Avenue. And Jeff unknowingly set Marvin on a collision course with the town, literally. Location was hidden on the town's main thoroughfare, which was also the street with Granby's only stoplight, about a half mile long Meadow Street. Crane told him the site used to be a concrete plant. And then the, quote, guy who owned it went bankrupt. Place got picked up by the FDIC, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. The building, which had been on the market for three years, was painted in ugly, pale yellow, sat in a two-acre patch of dirt. It's a pretty isolated location, tore up pretty badly, but the building itself was 3,000 square feet. 
and there were three big old bay doors, perfect for an auto body garage. Marvin claimed to have asked, is the previous owner looking to buy it back? And the realtor apparently said, not that I know of, and maybe he didn't know that the previous owner intended to buy it back, but a previous owner did for sure intend to buy it back. And this becomes a big issue that leads to all the other issues in today's tale. Marvin was told that the FDIC was going to auction off the property in a few weeks. A lot of people would be bidding and that the property's current value is $110,000. Cool. Marvin called Kleiner, told him about the property. They agreed not to pay a dollar over $66,000. Since Kleiner didn't have that kind of cash laying around in liquid form, Marvin offered to finance the sixty-six grand, and Kleiner accepted. In case you don't know, when it, when it comes to a land auction like this, you have to come to the auction with the cashier's check for the maximum amount you're willing to spend. There's no mortgage. There's going to be no financing. The land goes to the highest bidder, and the highest bidder must be able to pay the full amount, buy the land in full on the day of the bid. After John Kleiner and Marvin agree on their deal, Marvin calls the FDIC and local agent Peter Colley meets him at the property, takes off the padlock and the buildings off the building's doors, lets Marvin inspect the place, which is pretty unusual in a land auction situation. Usually you don't get to inspect shit. Uh, Marvin feels even better about the possible deal. He knows the location will absolutely work as a garage. Peter tells Marvin about an EPA audit situation that had been done on the property, something about how oil was improperly disposed of or something like that, but acts as if it's not something to worry about. So Marv doesn't worry about it. It seems so insignificant, he forgets all about it. The day of the auction arrives, Marv arrives alone. He sits near the back of the auction in a conference room at the Denver Hotel. There were 160 properties up for sale that day, the auctioneer said, and the heaviness of the crowd fluctuated as the properties were sold off. About halfway through the auction, there were still a number of people remaining when the old Granby concrete plant came up for sale. Property 67, zoned for both commercial and industrial. The minimum bid was set at only $20,000. When the auctioneer opened the bidding, the audience was mainly silent. This was not a highly sought after property. I imagine the auctioneer uh, may have sounded something like this. We have a two-acre union grain in Colorado zone for both commercial and industrial perfect place to open auto shop, mother shop, concrete plant, sunglass hut, to KFC, Taco John, dollar store, mini mart, gas station, truck stops, mud shop, small gym, large gym, step into a slim gym, rock shop, hawk shop, pawn shop, mall shop, sock hop, roller ring, hog and ring, two in the pink, one in the stink, tackle shop, crop top, wife swap. It is the perfect place to open a liquor store, general store, storage wars, eye sore, cold sore. Who doesn't like a campfire s'more? Going once, going twice, ball three, safe at first, touchdown. Turnover, Red Rover, Red Rover, Marvin sent right over one, two, three strikes. You're out of here. Or something like that. I don't know, it's just fun to talk fast. Initially, only two men. I wish I could be an auctioneer. I wish I could be a fake auctioneer. I wish I could, you know, just talk, just bribe an auctioneer just to like take take the afternoon off and then just show up and pretend like I know what I'm doing and just fucking just complete mayhem. Just nonsense. Just gibberish up there. Oh, okay. We're starting out with a bit at uh, $1, $2, $1 million, $1 billion, dollars, going back to $5, $400, $1,000, billion, dollars, trillion, dollars, going back to $2. We're going to go over to pesos, 300,000 pesos, 400,000. We're going to go to ducats. I think that's an Italian currency. I'm not sure. We're going to go over a dollar store, general store. We are bidding on a teddy bear on a fucking three kids. We are selling a small family from uh, fucking Idaho. We are what? Like what? Just people like, what is he talking about? Okay. Okay. So initially only two men, both sitting together in the front row would speak up during the auction. One of the men was Cody Doshif, the former owner of the property, the former, former owner of the concrete plant. Uh, the, the, the other was Gus Harris, a fellow Granby business owner. Together, they offer $35,000. Marvin quickly counters with an offer of $37,000. The two men seem a little surprised. You know, they return with the bid of $38,000. Marvin immediately ups his bid to $42,000. This reportedly pissed Cody and Gus the hell off. They seem genuinely surprised that anyone else has bid on the property. It seemed like they're clearly not expecting this. Marvin will soon learn they were not expecting this at all. They scowl at Marvin as the auctioneer goes on to declare the sale is final at $42,000. Marvin's pumped. He's landed his old business partner and himself a steal of a deal. If his shop uh, doesn't work out, you know, they could sell uh, the land, at least make a healthy profit. You know, they, they had over $60,000 in immediate equity. An FDIC employee presents Marvin with the papers to sign to finalize the sale. And that's when, according to most sources, one of the men who had lost the bidding, Cody Doshef, approaches Marvin and says, I own that property. I sold it three years ago and the guy went bankrupt. And the FDIC took it. Cody was the man who'd once, you know, ran a concrete plant out of the shop, you know, where Marvin had just bought, uh, the Marvin had just bought. The realtor was wrong. A previous owner did want to buy it back. <laughs> Whoops. Oh my heck. This is, this is awkward. Sorry, fellas. Didn't know. Uh, according to our main source, a book called Malice, the Rampage and Revelation of Marvin Heemeyer by Liam Llewellyn, the men had the following conversation. 
Marvin didn't know what to say, so he instead looked at the larger man beside Doshef and introduced himself. I'm Marv Hemeyer. What's your name? Gus Harris, Doshef said. He owns the land just south of my land. Listen, Marvin said, I asked the realtors whether the previous owner was interested in buying back the property, and they said no. If it means that much to you, I'll sell you the property for $66,000. I can't pay $66,000, Doshef said. I just offered $38,000. Right, so it's a little, a little uncomfortable. Uh, well, I'm sorry, I'm selling it to my friend for $42,000, Marvin said. You give me $66,000, I'll sell it to you, and we'll find another place. That's my property, and I offered $38,000. Which Marvin's defense uh, here, um, you know, it's, it's not true. It was your property, Cody, was. If you really didn't want to part with it, you shouldn't have sold it. So, you know, kind of kind of tough shit. Uh, Marvin does not say this to Dojif, tries to play peacekeeper, which I think was very kind of him. He says, Mr. Dojif, I don't want to rock the boat. You know, but I got to make some money on this deal. If you can't pay $66,000, I got to say goodbye. That's my property, Dojif said. This town can't survive without a concrete plant. I'm sorry, Mr. Dojif. And then Marvin walked away. And the wheels have been set in motion for a big local feud. Back at his cabin, you know, near Grand Lake, Marvin calls Kleiner, who's thrilled that Marvin has gotten the property for 42 grand. Marvin shares the story of this fucking asshole, quote unquote, Doshif. Marvin, not a fan of Cody or Gus, and they're for sure not fans of his. And then according to John Kleiner, he and Marvin have the following conversation. Oh, I forgot to tell you, Marvin said, the realtor Peter Colley reminded me today of this EPA audit that was apparently done on the property. Oh, what was it about? Marvin explained to Kleiner that he'd been told it was like an oil stain issue. But Collie told me it's all finished with, all cleaned up, shouldn't be a problem, Marv said. And then Kleiner was quiet for an uncomfortable moment, hopped off the phone a moment later. Then about a week later, Kleiner calls Marvin and tells him he doesn't want the property anymore. Like, what? He's irritated over the details that he wasn't given about the EPA audit, worried that some EPA problem would pop up in the future and bite him in the ass. He says, I'm sorry, but sell it to that Doshif guy. And then Marvin tells him, John, I paid $42,000 for it. He wants $38,000. And then John apologizes, shit, I, I don't know, Marv. I'm sorry. So Marv is now stuck in a pretty terrible spot. Sounds like it's partially his own fault, though. He should have disclosed the EPA details. He didn't communicate the full details to his business partner. Now his partner doesn't feel good about basing his financial future on this building site. So Marv is left holding his dick in his hand, so to speak. Uh, I suppose technically he could, you know, take his friend John to court, but that probably would only make things worse. You know, he'd lose a relationship with a guy who he might be able to do business with in the future if he goes back to Boulder. And, uh, you know, and if he didn't disclose all the details to John, he probably wouldn't win anyway. So now Marv owns property he doesn't want and has two local enemies. And before we move further in this story, it feels like a good place for another sponsor. Time Suck is brought to you today by Lisa. If everyone in today's tale would have been able to get a good, solid night's sleep, Maybe nothing crazy would happen. Building a killdozer, that feels like a decision born at least partly out of sleep deprivation. Uh, Lisa believes that a bed is more than just a place to sleep. It's a place for relaxation or rest. And they believe that everybody has the right to rest. That's why they make two awesome mattresses plus accessories and bases to give your body the deep rest it needs. Lisa's mission is to provide a better night's sleep for everybody. And from day one, Lisa set out to create a company with heart. That's why they donate one mattress for every 10 they sell to organizations that work in causes like foster care prevention. Uh, to date, they've donated more than 32,000 mattresses through more than 1,000 nonprofits. Month after month, my Lisa holds up. Uh, Lindsay and I are rearranging our room a bit, getting some uh, new bed frame. Lindsay's had her eye on for a year or so, but we're not getting a new mattress because our Lisa is still working incredibly well. Still as good as uh, it was when we got it over two years ago. Quality sleep that holds up night after night, month after month. So get your Lisa. Get 15% off your entire order at lisa.com slash timesuck. Use the promo code timesuck. That's L-E-E-S-A dot com slash timesuck. Promo code timesuck. Link in that episode description. Oh, and also somebody brought this up once before uh, concerning Lisa uh, about foster care prevention. They're not anti-foster care. They're just trying to keep kids from uh, being placed in foster care, trying to keep them at home, trying to keep them, you know, like with adopted families, you know, just in a more permanent home situation. That's all. We had a, we had a foster parent writer. I'm like, why would they be against it? They're not, they're not against it. You know, they're just trying to, you know, get, uh, get kids in more long-term care situations. That's all. It's good. It's all good. It's all good with Lisa. Uh, now let's get back to the summer of 1992 and see what Marvin is going to do about the controversial two acres he's purchased. Marvin doesn't know what to do with the land he's bought initially. Fortunately, he doesn't have to decide anything soon. Since he bought the land free and clear, since he doesn't have a mortgage, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not hurting him. He still has those lease payments coming in from Boulder. 
Still doesn't have to work, so he takes his time figuring out what to do next. Uh, meanwhile, the topic of legalized gambling becoming a bigger, bigger issue in the county, and Marvin, for reasons I don't fully understand, becomes more emotionally invested in legalized gambling in Grand County. Probably doesn't like politicians telling him, you know, where and how he can spend his money. I, I, I get it, I guess. You know, he, he's so into this issue, he writes and publishes two issues of what he calls a newspaper, the Grand Lake Gazette. It's not a newspaper. It's a four-page tabloid-sized pamphlet extolling the value legalized gambling would bring uh, legalized gambling would bring to the county. Marvin's pamphlet pisses a few people off, and he has a few public run-ins. He gets into some kind of argument with the editor of the actual local paper, again, Patrick Brower. And I, and I think this kind of speaks to him being a little bit of a nut. <laughs> when you start publishing a pamphlet and hand it around about an issue that actually doesn't really affect your life, eh, maybe a little bit, uh, a little bit of a character, shall we say. Uh, this summer, Marvin also decides he might as well fix up his newly acquired property. Why not? Right? He's got time. The reason is never explicitly stated as far as I can tell. I imagine, you know, uh, so he could maybe get some more out of selling it at a later date. Bud Wilson, the superintendent of the Granby area water district comes to pay him a visit as he's fixing this property up. After introducing himself, Wilson tells him they need to talk about getting the property hooked up to the water grid, to the, to the sewer, to the city sewer. He'll need to hook up, you know, at some point. Uh, Asking him about a septic tank. Marv answers, uh, I don't even have a proper septic tank. It's just the barrel of a mixing truck down there. Probably put in by that dough chef guy. Wilson tells him, well, there's going to be a district meeting in October at the town hall. You might want to go. We'll tell you everything you need to know, the process, the timeline, everything. Marvin replies, great. Do I need an attorney involved or anything? No, 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 no. We'll get you the paperwork. Just tell us you want to get hooked up, pay a fee, and that'll be it. And Marvin says, great. Seems like it's going to be easy peasy, but you know it won't be. Marvin's meeting with the local officials will be the beginning of continual conflict between Marvin and the local bureaucracy. Uh, more on that in a bit. First, Gus Harris re-enters our story, Doshif's auction partner. A few days after he started fixing up the property, Marvin has, uh, he sees Gus Harris through a chain link fence, cutting some steel out on his property. They have a friendly talk. Marvin, you know, tells him he didn't mean to piss off his buddy, Cody Doshif. Later in August, Marvin sees Gus again, decides to speak with him, as he'd occasionally done throughout the summer, hoping to get into Doshev's good graces, or at least get Harris to tell, you know, his friend that Marvin's not a bad guy. Small town political shit, country diplomacy, good for Marvin. Gus has come to tell him uh, uh, that he's looking to sell his property now, a two-acre lot for just $17,500. Marvin lets him know he's interested, but he wants to get his shop up and running for a few months first to avoid being spread too thin. Now he's, you know, he thinks he's, he's, he might as well get a muffler shop going in town. Uh, that October, Marvin goes to the water district's meeting at the local town hall. Remember, Wilson told him it was practically a done deal. All he had to do was, you know, tell the board he wanted to get hooked up, pay a little fee, and he'd, he'd be annexed into the district. Well, according to sources, the board states that Marvin's property needs a lift station and 100 feet of service line to connect it to the active sewer main east of the shop. In total, this is all going to cost him nearly $100,000. So, heck! Uh, my wife, Lindsay, a former realtor, tells me this sounds pretty standard. Hooking up to a city water and sewer, especially for commercial and industrial use, can be pretty fucking expensive. Uh, additionally, Marvin's property doesn't have a maintenance easement to access the sewer line. So that would have to be installed in between Marvin's and Gus's property. So Marvin would now have to get Harris to approve an easement to cross his land before anything can start. That's going to become a huge issue. Superintendent Bud Wilson will also have to get approval from Fred Collins, who owns another property beneath uh, in the area where the sewer is going to be located and you know where, where the, the sewer line would have to be extended. So the whole thing's getting real fucking messy now. Ron Thompson, the board's vice president, encourages Marvin to keep his current septic tank makeshift as it is. If Marvin is interested in the sewer connection, Thompson and his family, they operate an excavating business and they can do most of the work. Uh, could being on the board to decide who essentially needs excavation work be considered a conflict of interest for someone who runs an excavation business? Yeah, of course. Is this kind of thing common in small towns? Uh, yeah. A lot, of, a lot of the time, the only people really interested in local politics are the people getting shit done locally, like small business owners. And thus conflicts arise. My grandpa Ward was the city inspector in Riggins, Idaho, while also being one of the main carpenters in the area. You know, that could be, that was a conflict of interest. You know, he had, he had to inspect his own work. Uh, but, you know, no one else wanted the damn job. So he did it. That stuff happens in small towns all the time. Okay, so now, as I said, and you don't need to remember all these details. I just wanted to spell them out very uh, clearly for the people very familiar with this story. Um, but you just need to know the Marvin situation is now complicated. Uh, you know, so now Marvin is going to have to dump $100,000 on top of the 42 large he'd already dumped into a property he never intended to manage himself. That sucks. Whose fault is all this? It's really hard to say. Did anyone tell him before the auction about all this? Probably not. But again, with an auction, you know, it's kind of an as is type of deal. You don't have to be told. 
shitty but not illegal, probably status quo. So at this point, this is just an irritating and unfortunate situation for Marvin for sure. Uh, I don't think there's any real enemies to be found. Also, Marvin could just leave the situation now. He could get the fuck out of this deal. I bet he could have offered this property for sale for, say, 80000 maybe 70000 Might have to sit on it for a while, but it's valued again at over 100000 So he probably could have at least broken even on it or made some money. You know, he probably could have walked away, uh, you know, with, with some dough and things. He, worst case, he could have sold it to Doshef for a loss of just what, uh, four thousand dollars. I mean, the, the guy's top bid was thirty-eight. You know, he he went in at forty-two. Not saying that would have been fun, but there were options. I'm sure you know more options than I just laid out. But Marvin doesn't take any of these options. He decides to open his muffler shop for the time being. He decides to not connect it to the city sewer or water, knowing that could present real problems down the road. Knowing it likely would eventually present problems. To spread the word of the opening of the Mountain View Muffler, his new shop, uh, Marvin advertises in the Sky High News. He meets with his uh, legalizing gambling opponent, Patrick Brower, the editor of that paper, going to put this bad blood behind him. After the advertising contracts are signed, Brower says the paper wants to do an article about the muffler shop's opening and give readers an introduction to Marvin, if Marvin would like that. He has extended an olive branch. A sign of goodwill for sure. However, the story will never be written. Brower will claim this is a result of a miscommunication between himself and Marvin, with Marvin's shop not being open when Brower comes by in an agreed upon time to interview him. Marvin doesn't see this way and feels insulted. Which story is correct? Not sure. However, I do think it's pretty clear that Brower doesn't care for this guy. If he really wanted to write the story, he could have come back over, but he doesn't. So now bad blood remains, maybe a little thicker. And it also speaks, I think, to uh, you know Marvin's confrontational nature. He could have, I'm sure, done something to get the article written, but he clearly didn't. So this guy is, you know, you know, he just, he's, he seems a little cantankerous. Uh, This fall, Marv also talks to Gus Harris about getting the easement he needed to hook up to the city septic. He's, uh, he was glad he'd seemed to make peace with Harris about unknowingly scooping the property from Dojef, but Harris now does not want to cooperate on the easement. Harris is mad that Marvin wouldn't buy his two acres earlier for 17,500. See, this keeps getting more kind of spun, the situation. Marvin explains he just didn't want to take on more debt that he could handle, but now Gus doesn't give a shit. He feels slighted. He feels like if he gives him the easement, then Marvin will then never buy the property from him, and neither will whoever Marvin may sell it to in the future. He feels like kind of like the real value in this property is, uh, you know, holding off on the easement rights. So now Marvin is at odds with Gus, Doshef, Patrick Brower, who knows who else locally is pissed at him. The thing keeps getting messier. New guy not scoring a lot of points with locals. At the Water District's November meeting, Marvin makes a formal request to be hooked onto the sewer line, though Collins still has not approved Bud Wilson's extension request. Fucking red tape. I can feel Marvin's blood begin to boil. I get it. No one likes dealing with that. The board says they'll send an annexation order for Marvin's property to the district court for approval. Tell him they'll be in contact if Collins ever contacts them back. In the meantime, they ask Marvin if he'd talk to Harris about getting that easement across his property. Marvin tells him that Gus had not given him permission, but he's working on it. Following the meeting, Marvin knocks on Gus's door, Gus Harris's shop door. Gus invites Marvin inside. Marv asks if the offer of 17.5 is still good. Now Harris says he wants 20 grand. What a dick. Marvin agrees to pay him the 20 grand and they shake hands. And then three months go by. By January of 1993, Marvin and Harris have yet to finalize the sale of Harris's property. Marvin delivers contracts for Harris and him to sign. And suddenly it's radio silence. Had Dochev talked him into not selling, Did Gus's handshake deal not mean shit? More problems with the locals, right? By February of 1993, Marvin determines that Gus Harris had in fact reneged on the deal and decided to keep his property, so fuck Gus. So he can't hook up now to the city sewer line. The concrete shop had never been connected. They still did business. So he thinks, fuck it, I'll just do the same. And he does. By 1993, Marvin's muffler shop is doing a steady stream of business, the kind Marvin Marvin had been accustomed to in Boulder. He's doing well. He also thought of a new business venture to open up in Granby. Grand Lake had a dozen, or in the Granby area. Uh, Granby, sorry. Grand Lake had a dozen, sorry, there's so many details. Uh, It's, uh, I I was struggling. I've gone over this so many times. It was really tricky to put all this together because there is not a good cohesive kind of narrative to, to build this conflict that we could find online. Had to piece it from a lot of sources. Okay, so this new business venture, Grand Lake has a uh, a dozen boat storage facilities where tourists can keep their boats stored by the hour, by the month. Granby doesn't have any. Even though he's watched tourists drive around the town in search uh, of an open storage space because they haven't been able to find a vacant one in Grand Lake. So Marvin sees the demand, realizes he can fulfill the supply. Capitalism, baby. 
He starts sketching out plans to build a boat storage facility next to his muffler shop on his existing commercial acreage. Construction starts in the fall of 93, and it's ready just in time for the summer of 94. Marvin's new facility, 50 feet wide, 120 feet long, three bay doors, leading into a single 6,000 square foot interior. This will be the place he builds the killdozer. Uh, Marvin plans to put up divider walls in the interior in order to create three 2,000 square foot storage spaces, each with their own entrance. Making that, making those bow bucks, making those dock ducats, making that storage scratch, making that lake loot. I'll stop again. Uh, Marvin also revisits yet again, uh, hooking up to the city sewer line. He appeals to the town planning commission to get his property rezoned from industrial to highway general business, HGB, which includes commercial. So no reassessing or surveying needs to be done. He thinks this rezoning can possibly reduce the hoops he'd have to jump through for, where, for reasons, again, never explicitly stated in source materials, more bureaucracy. Marvin pays the town a fee, signs some contracts. Suddenly his property is HGB, but this change does not help him with the sewer line issue. And I guess I should probably point out why this damn sewage line uh, hookup is so fucking important. It's important because uh, the, sewage, the sewer issue will become a real problem down the road for Marv. It could get him kicked off his property. If any business around him is ever uh, able to hook or ever chooses to hook into the city sewer and water, that would then, quote unquote, activate the city sewer line closest to him. And suddenly the city would then require him by law to hook up. And then if he, at that point, didn't hook up, he would be subject to repeated fines, expensive fines, and possibly be forced to shut down until he did hook up. So to prevent that, he would have to get an easement from a neighbor who didn't have to legally give him that easement, right? This, this property is, uh, this the whole situation sounded pretty shitty. Sounds like he should have sold it when he first found out he had no easement rights, uh, that, that none of them were grandfathered into the deal. And remember, Gus Harris a guy who doesn't care for him, has the rights he needs. So while work is currently going well, you know, Marvin's dealing with some stress, little anxiety about the future of his business. But again, you know, he knew this going in. Despite this nagging sewer line issue, up until 1996, everything goes great for Marv financially. The muffler shop is doing well. But then the other muffler shop back in Boulder, that one uh, Brandstetter was running, well, the payments start coming in late. Fucking classic Doug Brandstetter. That's just Doug being Doug. Uh, in January of 1997, Doug Brandsitter abandons the Boulder muffler business, disappears without a trace. Marvin is notified by Harold Pelly, his land manager. Marvin drives to Boulder to remove all of his tools, equipment, which he then stores on his property in Granby, shuts down the Boulder shop, keeps the property, and asks Pelly to start looking around for another leaser. Pelly luckily quickly finds one, a man named Doug Davis. Another Doug. Ah, oh, classic Pelly. Pelly, great at getting Dougs. No one is better at locating a Doug who can handle a muffler than fucking Pelly. Harold Doug Finding Pelly. What a Doug Finding son of a bitch. Don't get jelly. That's just Pelly. Maybe people used to say that. Uh, this guy Pelly found uh, this guy, other Doug who had managed a Midas in Denver for years. Uh, wanted to be a working manager of his own shop. Marvin meets with him. The two hit it off. They agree on a lease. Marvin gives him a lower monthly rate. And uh, muffler meltdown averted. One fire has been put out. Unfortunately, another one is now flaring up back in Granby. In early 1997, Gus fucking Thorne and Marv Side Harris sells those two cursed acres of land that he won't give an easement on, right, to Marv on, and he sells them to Cody Dochev. Son of a bitch. He and Cody are now neighbors. What could, what could go wrong with this? Oh, so much. Marvin and Cody speak from each, uh, each other side of the chain link fence that separated their property. It's been almost five years now since Marv inadvertently undercut Cody's plan to buy his old land back. And apparently they had a very interesting conversation that did not end in matching BFF bracelets. Allegedly, Dochev kicked off the conversation by asking Marvin, don't feel too good getting property stolen from you, does it? Well, well, well. He's got you there, Marv. Again, I know you didn't mean to take the land that Cody had his eye on, but it's kind of got you there, buddy, old, old horse partner, old pal, or some kind of shit. Then Marv says, Mr. Dochev, don't you think it's time to move on? We're going to be neighbors. We should bury the... And then Cody interrupts. And this is all according to, uh, to Marvin, this part. You sit... Uh, he says, Cody says, you big city hotshots just sashay into these small towns. You take what you want. It don't matter what belongs to who. If you have the money, it's yours. And there it is. There's that small town us versus them mentality. That you're coming in to take all of our shit mentality. And although it might sound crazy, I do get it. I mean, imagine growing up in a little town where your family had lived for generations, and you love it. You graduate from the same high school that your father and mother and grandfather and grandfather or grandmother had all graduated from. 
you get a job in this town, you build your life on the same streets, you know, that, that you grew up on. You know, your kids play in the same streets you did. You have your sights on some lot. You used to ride your bike past when you were a kid. And then someone from out of town swoops in and buys it, spends more money than you can afford. Someone who worked in a much bigger town where there were a lot more jobs that pay a lot more money. It's the way of the world, but it's also sad. People get pushed out of their towns all the time when so their town suddenly becomes a transplant destination for people coming from a place with higher paying jobs, more expensive real estate. Happens here in Coeur d'Alene. You know, people from Orange County selling homes they bought 10 years ago when the market was depressed, you know, and then by paying their mortgage, they built several hundred thousand dollars worth of equity and they, they sell, move here, drive the real estate market up by 20, 30, 40%. Suddenly young locals can't afford to buy a first home because a $250,000 house is just outside their budget. But, it, but it's not shit to someone who just sold a smaller house for 1.3 million down in Irvine and now has 500,000 in equity to throw around. I get the frustration. I really do. Not Marvin's fault but I get Cody's frustration. Marvin replies with, yeah, that's not how the system works, Mr. Dochev. Now, listen, you want this property, I'll sell it to you. I'll get it appraised and we can work something out. Fact is, I'm not too thrilled about being near a concrete plant and I might as well get out of your way. And then Cody apparently is happy to look into Marvin's proposal. Marvin calls uh, Doudner and Wilson commercial appraisals in Grand Lake, sets up an appointment for the next day to have Marvin's two acres in Grand be evaluated. The result, even with the new storage facility, cleaned up grounds and profitable muffler shop, surprises Marvin, who thought Jeff Crane might have been, uh, you know, uh, kind of off in his initial appraisal of, or might not, sorry, might not have been too far off in his initial appraisal of 110000 Now his property is apparently worth 270000 That night, Marvin looks over his bank statements, checkbook, contracts, other financial documents, factors in. You know, what effect an additional 270 large would have on his long-term financial well-being. He already has a nice little nest egg set up for himself. Not enough to live the retirement, you know, he wants, but acceptable, more than acceptable for most. And again, he's only 45 years old. He figures if he can get 270,000 for the property and the building, then he can auction off the backhoe and the beat truck, maybe uh, build another boat storage facility bigger somewhere else in Granby. And that combined with Davis's monthly payments from Boulder, would be almost as much as he was making working in his muffler shop now. And he might allegedly wants to fit in a little better with his neighbors. It's hard to have enemies that like, you know, in a small town, harder than it is in the city because you run into them all the damn time. They shop at the same stores, eat in the same cafes, drink at the same bars. Marvin thought maybe if he could sell the property to Doche for, you know, 250000 then Doche would be happy. So they could squash this whole beef. He approaches Doche with this offer. And uh, apparently Cody says he'd think about it. Good enough for now, Marvin thinks. But then Marvin would claim that Dochev didn't get back to him. Even after Marvin talked with him, his wife Susie, his son Joe, Marvin stressed them he's willing to negotiate the price, but even then he says the Dochevs did nothing and did, didn't talk to him. That is Marvin's side of the story. The Dochevs claim it wasn't like that at all. They claim Marvin made Cody his offer. They shook on it. Cody told him he just needed to get his concrete plan approved, and then if it was approved, the purchase was a done deal. Cody then went to the town of Granby, asked that the town would begin uh, would be open to him building an indoor concrete plant on the four acres of land there he would have, land that would include the Hemeyer property and the land they'd recently purchased from Gus. The town indicated they would, in fact, approve that site. And then Cody and his wife, Susie, claimed that they came back to Marvin, told him they would, in fact, buy the property for 250 grand, done deal. But they say Hemeyer changed the deal on him. They say his damn handshake, uh, you know, deal didn't mean anything, uh, thing, you know, more apparently than Gus uh, Harris's handshake deal had meant with Marvin. So Susie, she said in interviews that Marv then came back to us and said he now wanted $375,000 and that they simply couldn't afford it. That's a big jump, extra 125 grand. Joe Doshiff, Cody and Susie's son, said Marv explained that he'd increased his price because, you know, he figured the lot was worth more now that the town had tentatively approved it as a building site. And if that is true, if it is, then Marv Hemer uh, has now dug his own grave in the situation. I don't feel an ounce of sympathy for him. If it's true, then he is the most to blame for the situation that led to his killdozer rampage. Did greed lead him into the big killdozer mess? Good old-fashioned greed? Then after raising the price to $375,000, according to Cody and Susie, he just kept raising the price. And they gave up on working with him, and they formed a new plan. And now a stalemate ensues. Marv is not going to sell the Dochefs his land so they could build their concrete plant, and the Dochefs are not going to give Marv an easement he needs to hook up his muffler shop to the city's sewer and water, which means that at some future point, he will be operating illegally, and he would be fucked. The next source of escalation in this ongoing conflict occurs in 1999, and we'll talk about it right after a word from our last sponsor of the day. 
It's a new podcast from Parcast, Natural Disasters. Some disasters are man-made, like today's upcoming disaster, a killdozer rampage. And you can usually see them coming. They're at least, you know, warning signs, red flags. But with natural disasters, you rarely see them coming. Unstoppable forces destined for causing destruction that seemingly come out of nowhere, natural disasters. Every Thursday, the Parcast Network investigates Mother Nature's most devastating catastrophes in their new original podcast, Natural Disasters. Tsunamis, tornadoes, earthquakes, and more. Each episode explores the historical impact of a monumental tragedy, analyzing the effect it had on the people and places involved, like the 2010 earthquake that debilitated Haiti, claiming the lives of hundreds of thousands of people, or the 1995 Chicago heat wave, which led to over 700 heat-related deaths during just a five-day period. My God, I don't remember that one. Or what about the volcanic eruption of Mount Vesuvius in 79 AD, which completely buried the ancient city of Pompeii and its people in ash? Discover more in the ParCast original series, Natural Disasters. Visit ParCast.com slash Natural Disasters or search for Natural Disasters in the Spotify app and listen free today. Now back to 1999 and the disaster someone maybe should have saw coming, a walking upcoming disaster known as Marvin Hemeyer. In the summer of 99, Marvin sees a public notice and Patrick, I'm going to be a crybaby when it comes to legalized gambling, Brower's Sky High News. One that really grinds his gears. It appears that Dochef, his fucking mortal enemy, had requested a contract to buy 21 acres of land directly west of Marvin's muffler shop and that he wanted to zone these acres as industrial. These acres were totally undeveloped, rocky, uneven ground that would be tough to use for much of anything other than industrial. Marvin's pissed. Dochev is basically now making a power move to basically, to almost completely surround him, which I do, I have to say, I, I find hilarious. I mean, imagine for a moment that Marvin Hemeyer is the asshole in the situation. Like, let's say he for sure is. Let's say that he did keep raising the price of the Dochevs. You know, he's the villain. He didn't need this muffler shop. He could have sold it to the Dochevs for a small loss of, you know, a couple thousand dollars, walked away from the whole thing. You know, he also could have probably gotten, you know, uh, you know, 38,000 from the Dochevs, financed the remaining, you know, 4,000, a little more, walked away with a small profit. I don't know, a little bit of interest, something, you know, they could have worked something out, but didn't, you know, he immediately wanted to make, you know, 20, you know, over, you know, $20,000 from Gus and Cody at the auction house. Not ideal. Karmically, you know, maybe not the best move. He could have walked away when he found out how much the city sewer and water hookup was, but he didn't. So what gets lost about the story online is that it was some poor guy barely scraping by who needed this muffler shop to survive, to pay for his groceries, which is not true. He never needed to open a muffler shop in Granby. Could have survived just fine without it. The city of Granby never bankrupted him. You know, bankrupted him. That's something that gets lost online in the narrative. He pursued the shop in spite of all of the problems. When he started repairing mufflers, he did it knowing that if the sewer line was ever connected, ever activated to any other business around him, he would be operating illegally. He knew that the whole time you know, that they could shut him down. You know, a, a quote attributed to Marvin on, on a lot of internet memes on Reddit threads is, I was always willing to be reasonable until I had to be unreasonable. Sometimes reasonable men do unreasonable things. I got to say, he doesn't seem like a reasonable man. And uh, I mean, I don't know. He seems very unreasonable. But let's just say, okay, let's just say, you know, so he, he is the villain in the story. How fun would it be if this was the guy kind of, you know, messing with your business plans, you know, messing with the money you're needed to get your concrete plan. You got to actually pull this chess move off of fucking surrounding him, buying all the land around him. You could pull that off. God, that would feel so good. Right? Check mate. Ah, we got you now, buddy. We got you surrounded, literally. Okay. So at this point in this ongoing tragedy, Marvin just, has just found out that the Doe have intended to try and do this, to buy 21 acres of land behind him. Muy no bueno for Marvin, obviously. Uh, also, he'd been using part of this undeveloped land for parking for his customers and as a place to stow their cars after he's done working on them. A place for them to be uh, out of the way until you know their owners have a chance to pick them up. Technically illegal, not his land. I would have done the same thing if I was him, but you know, not his land. And now if the Dochef deal goes through, he's not going to be able to do that anymore. Marvin's pissed on a personal level about the Dochef's desire to buy this land. You know, he would later claim in audio rantings he made before the before he died that he would have sold the land to the Dochef's for 250 grand. He claims, yeah, sure. You know, he raised the price, but, you know, they could have made a counteroffer and he would have accepted it. And now look what they're doing. Uh, Marvin speculates that 21 acres are, you know, going to cost more than 250 grand. So why couldn't they have just worked with him? Marvin claims at this point he visits Dochef again on his property to talk about this new attempted land grab. 
He says Dochev told him he didn't want his property anymore. He didn't want to buy it from Marv, but he would contract with him regarding a new easement issue, an easement that would be beneficial to both parties. In July of 1999, Marvin signs an easement release, which allows a maintenance easement to be built between the two properties to be used by both properties. The easement stipulates that neither Marvin nor the Dochevs could put any of their property such, uh, such as fixed cars or put on any of their property things such as fixed cars, concrete materials, you know, that it needed to be left clear and accessible. However, even with this new easement, Marvin claims he still would not be able to get hooked onto the sewer district. You know, he claims he reached out to the Dochefs about this. No one ever got back to him. So, you know, he is working with the Dochefs on this one issue, but he's pissed at them about this other issue. A few weeks later, Marvin finds a notice taped to the office door of his muffler shop, informing the public of an upcoming series of town board meetings to discuss Dochef's proposal to zone his new property from highway general business to industrial in order to build his new concrete batch plant. Two days later, Marvin sees from the outside uh, of his shop an earth mover on Dochef's newly acquired acreage digging up the ground. He wonders what the hell is going on. The plant had yet to be approved. Why are they tearing shit up? The next day, the land and the easement are crowded with people and a crane lowering some kind of tank into a huge hole. Marvin goes to the Granby Town Hall, requests the Planning Commission's report, Dochef's request for the land, uh, what his proposed use is going to be. The Planning Commission issues Dochef a permit, or he finds out the, the Planning Commission had issued Dochef a permit for five grand in order to install the water storage tank. The report written by Dochef's attorney, Richard Daly, states that the insula- or a report written by, yeah, yeah, Dochef's attorney, Richard Daly, states that the installation of the water tank has nothing to do with Dochef's proposal to rezone the property. Marvin's now conflicted. He feels like it does have something to do with rezoning the property. He wants to oppose the construction of the concrete plant at the town board meetings, but doesn't want to, you know, piss Dochef off further. Uh, has Dochef used that easement to manipulate him? He wonders that. He's, he's stewing on that question for several days. And then he goes to the first board meeting. After several days of stewing, he decides to oppose Dochef again, publicly, intentionally. At the meeting, Marvin steps up to the lectern to discourage the board from allowing Dochef's property to be rezoned to accommodate the concrete plant. He says it would negatively impact his own business. It would block its view from the highway. This does not make Dochef happy at all. Sharon Brenner, the executive director of the Greater Granby Chamber of Commerce, uh, who also owned with her husband the Homestead Motel just in front of Dochev's property, also voices some concern about the proximity of the plant and it negatively affecting her business. So to be fair to Marvin, he's not the only person against the building of the concrete plant, but he soon will become the only person. Susie and Joe Dochev disagree. They claim their operation will be much cleaner, not as bad as their opponents are saying. Uh, the board uh, would reconvene this discussion the following month. The next afternoon, Marvin is approached by a man named Mark, Mike Carmody. He says that he's attended the meeting and believed the town board and planning commission were acting illegally. This obviously gets Marvin's attention. Carmody lays out some dirt for him and says, I don't know how familiar you are with the board and the planning commission. They're all pretty much serve on the boards and commissions. Dick Thompson is on the trustee board. His son, Ron, is on the water board. They're a big family around here. Dick's been on the board for close to 20 years. He and his kids run an excavating, uh, excavating business. Larry, Dick's other son, sold Dochef some property about five acres out near Hot Sulphur Spring a couple years ago. That guy, Harris, who owned Dochev's property now, he used to be mayor of Granby. I heard the planning commission in 1991 spot zone Harris's property, turned it from HDB to industrial, which is technically illegal. But they did it without telling anyone, and 30 days later, it became legal. Then the Thompsons gave Harris some money in order to buy Dochev's land back, your property. So that both uh, Harris and Dochev's property would fuse together, I guess, and become industrial property, hide what the planning commission had done, and nobody would be able to protest it. So, okay. So there's, you know, some small town wheeling and dealing going on. And uh, maybe not all of it was 100% legal. Marvin asks if the, there's any, you know, uh, documents uh, pertaining to this claims this guy is making. He says it's all in the records. Marvin should get a lawyer. He says, you want to get this concrete plan stopped? You need to show the board you're serious. Otherwise, they're just going to ignore you. I know a guy in Boulder, Dietz. You heard of him? And he hands Marv uh, this attorney's card. He says it took a, a few days, you know, for him to think about uh, going to war with the town's biggest players and their perceived corruption. And were they corrupt? Sure, maybe. I mean, in the sense that they broke minor laws, get shit done from time to time. I get that that does happen to me. It's not that crazy. It's pretty normal. That's not how Marv sees it. In Marv's mind, these dirty fuckers had conspired to hurt his business, had colluded to break the law. They were trying to box in his muffler shop, suffocate him. You know, with the dust and operation smoke from the concrete plant, cut it off from the view of the highway, never allow him to hook into the sewer line. And they're playing dirty. And maybe they are. No, maybe they are playing dirty. Maybe Marvin is an outsider, should have treaded a little lighter 
in the game of small town diplomacy and politics. Of course, these people are going to work together and possibly against him if they all grew up together. I think not understanding that uh, just makes you pretty naive. If I wanted some city council decision to go my way here in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, some decision that Dwayne Hagedon stood on the other side of, the man who pretty much owns Coeur d'Alene, the man who built most of Coeur d'Alene, no fucking part of me would assume the decision is going to go my way. I would know going in, it's a, it's a losing battle. Dwayne is a demigod here. I'm an outsider. I accept that because I'm a realist. I'm reasonable. Marvin, not so reasonable. Uh, Marvin makes, an, and I'm just going over all this again in a lot of detail, and, and I'll make clear why in the idiots of the internet coming up later, because the internet is convinced that this guy got fucked over. And I think it's because it's kind of a complicated issue to understand. And if you gloss over all this, it can look like Marvin is the victim. But if you dig deep into the details, it does not look that way at all, to me at least. Marvin makes an appointment with an attorney, Dietz, for the following week, goes to Boulder to meet him. Dietz assures Marvin that he has a case. And after they discuss Marvin's hopes for a lawsuit, after he pays Dietz's retainer, Dietz uh, tells Marvin to return to Granby and take pictures of Dochev's property, document everything he can. Marvin does this, buys a dozen disposable cameras, goes out at night on Dochev's 21 acres to photograph tractors and bulldozers, trucks parked around the cordoned off pit in which the water storage tank is being installed. Dietz attends the next month's board meeting in Granby with Marvin and afterwards asks Marvin to send him copies of this in the last meetings, meetings, minutes, and agendas. Marvin gets the minutes from the town's recorder's office without problems, mails them to Dietz. A week later, Dietz responds saying that there's some serious procedural errors going on. Of course there were. They're volunteer politicians. They're the equivalent of kids playing dress up and pretending to be grownups. I bet you could find procedural errors in just about every other small town city volunteer uh, council meeting in the country every single year. A series of back and forth conversations between Dietz and the Dochef's lawyers occur. During the next meeting, Deech allegedly tells Marvin, they all know we've got him by the balls. Deech is adamant that in addition to the violations of zoning and building laws, the board and the planning commission were also breaking the law in ways such as changing meeting agendas and the occurrence of when votes during the meetings are happening. Hemeyer tells local Mike Carmody that he's thinking of filing a lawsuit against the town of Granby, but that he's nervous that doing so is not going to be good for my business or personal life. Carmody encourages him to go forward tells him he'll be admired by those who are sick of this local corruption. Uh, this comedy se seems like a real pot stirrer, by the way. Uh, that week's Tuesday issue of the Sky High News features an editorial written by Marvin's old gambling buddy, Patrick Brower, complaining that the vote on the concrete plant had been postponed. Patrick names Marvin and Dietz as the instigators for the postponement, criticizes them for intimidating the board of trustees so that they wouldn't hold the vote. Patrick writes, the concrete plant is a much needed business for the sake of Granby's economy and in essence, the economy of the whole of Grand County. The sales tax that would be generated from the concrete plant selling manholes, septic tanks, and concrete would feed Granby's coffers and circulate more revenue in the town, which will allow current businesses and future businesses to prosper. Marvin's pissed. He feels picked on. He doesn't like it when people get called out. He had talked to Patrick about that before. He writes a response letter. Whatever sales tax Granby stands to benefit from because of Cody Dochev's proposed concrete plant isn't worth the detrimental effects this plant will have on businesses located around it, specifically the Homestead and Broken Arrow motels. Before, there were just railroad tracks across from the motel, which were bad enough, waking everybody up at night. But now there might be a concrete plant? Dochev and the board have not discussed the issue of hours of operation, and really the town, county, and state don't have regulations for this. There are federal regulations, but will these be implemented by local authorities? And if not, why would Dochev and his concrete plant follow these regulations? Right? It's becoming a big conflict. Marvin, under the advice of his attorney Dietz, attempts to recruit other business owners to join him in his lawsuit against the town. No one joins him. Where are you, Sharon Brenner? Aren't you worried about your motel? Apparently not that worried. Why does no one join him? Is it because they're afraid to stand up against this tiny little town's tyrannical volunteer government? Or does no one else just really give a shit? Is it not actually that big of a deal to anyone other than Marvin Hemeyer? The concrete plant continues to move towards operational status. Marvin feels deflated by no one joining him in his fight. He's losing money by paying Dietz legal fees. He thinks, why should I care? Right? Maybe I should just leave. Too bad he didn't. Dochev tries again to sell, or I'm sorry, uh, Hemeyer again tries to sell this cursed piece of property. He gets it reappraised and offers it yet again to the Dochevs. 
In early 2000, the properties reappraised at a value of $395,000, which I got to say seems insane to me. The beginning of the buildup to the big real estate bubble that would pop in 2008. How is it worth $395,000? It was valued at just over $100,000 less than a decade earlier. It was valued at $270,000 just three years earlier. Real estate appraisal. It's fucking crazy. Marvin says he sends a copy of the appraisal and an ask of $375,000 to the Dochefs, who never respond with a counteroffer. The Dochefs would later say they'd already you know, been asked to pay even more than that by Marvin. He, and, and that he had his chance to sell earlier and that he blew it by being greedy. By the summer of 2000, the concrete plant construction begins. The foundation for the concrete plant is poured on Dochev's 21 acres. You know, Marvin is surrounded. The false hope providing, uh, you know, attorney Dietz persuaded Marvin not to shut down his shop by assuring him that the concrete plant's construction, it'll be stopped, right? They're going to win their lawsuit. It's all going to be okay. You know, Dochev's just wasting money. In September of 2000, Marvin is monetarily punished by the town of Granby for the first time. It's that's how he perceives it. He's fined $1,200 by the planning commission for junk cars and scrap metal on his property, which they say is overlapping onto Dochev's property, violating the easement agreement. Marvin, you know, ah, not real happy. Uh, he probably doesn't, you know, privately scream profanities or stomp around in his remote cabin or smash stuff or anything. In the September 7th, 2000 issue of Sky High News, there was an inside article titled Granby Tickets Mountain View Muffler Over, quote, Junk. <laughs> A picture is run with the article that features the western side of Marvin's shop and boat storage facility with old cars and scrap parts piled up. Why are they piled up? Because he no longer gets to use that land he was using next door to store his shit. Damn Dochefs! Marv's angry. He's embarrassed. He's been publicly shamed. He claims later, this is when he saw the writing on the wall. He says this is when he realized that no matter what he did, that goddamn concrete plant was going to be built. He thinks his lawsuit is doomed. He sends a check in to pay his fine, and he writes the word cowards in the memo line. He's furious. January of 2001, the Granby Town Board officially approves the Dochev's preliminary, rezo preliminary rezoning proposal. Three weeks later, Marvin's lawsuit against the town goes to trial, and the case is heard in Hot Sulphur Springs by Richard P. Dochet, uh, not related to the Dochefs, uh, chief judge of Colorado's 14th Judicial District. It'll be a while before anyone hears his ruling. The wheels of justice sometimes take a while to turn. In May of 2001, the Granby Town Board unanimously votes to approve the actual construction of the concrete plant, which had already begun as we know. The town requires the Dochefs to sign a contract acknowledging that if they proceed with construction in light of the lawsuit against the town's decision to allow him to build, if the lawsuit is decided against them, the Dochefs will have no legal recourse to take against the town for their decision to allow him or them to build the plant. In June of 2001, Joe Dochef approaches Marvin with yet another offer. Drop the lawsuit now and the Dochefs will pay for Marvin's property to be hooked up into the sewer district, which he was legally required to do now, now that the sewer lines around him are active, right? The concrete plant had activated them. The shit has really hit the fan now for Marvin, right? The lines have been activated. His business not being hooked up to city sewer and water is now illegal. He doesn't have easement rights. They're not going to give him those rights. They've got him pinned in. He knows it. However, Marvin still refuses their offer. What the fuck? He refused it despite repeated notices from the town warning him that if he doesn't get a legal hookup, right, attached to the sewer district, he's going to be fined again. You know, the, the, and the Dochefs are now willing to pay to have him hooked up, willing to, to pay, you know, what's going to cost roughly $100,000. In this scenario, he can continue to operate his muffler shop legally. He can sell the business after they hook him up, probably make, you know, several hundred thousand dollars in profit. Yes, his shop will be behind their concrete plant a little bit if he chooses to stay. So what? People already know he's there. He, you know, he doesn't need a lot of foot traffic. It's a muffler store, not a fucking Froyo shop. But he doesn't do that. He doesn't take their offer because now it's personal. He wants him to pay literally. He's put all his, you know, mental energy in this lawsuit against the town. He, you know, it's, it's about revenge now. He's unwilling to back down. His sense of righteous justice is now driving him. One that could also be viewed as foolish pride. The following year, April 26, 2002, Marvin's lawsuit is dismissed. Fuck. That sinks his battleship. Marvin talks to Dietz about appealing the judge's ruling, but Dietz scarily returns his emails, doesn't return his phone calls. Clearly, the lawyer knows there's no recourse. Clearly, Marvin doesn't want to accept that. Marv now wonders if the town has conspired against him. He really thought he had a solid case. What happened? Paranoia begins to set in. They're all, they're all in it together. They're out to get him. He asked Dietz his advice and is told to write the judge a letter himself. At this point, Marv has paid Dietz somewhere near $100,000 for what he thought 
you know, uh, was going to be this, you know, this big lawsuit and it ends up being nothing. And if Marv really did pay Dietz somewhere near $100,000, then maybe Dietz is the one he should have fucking bulldozed, the lawyer. Damn Dietz. Uh, he estimates that he's, you know, also lost, you know, two to 300,000 more dollars through other factors. That part is probably not true. But that's what he thinks. Now he decides to shut down his Mountain View muffler shop. He feels like maybe it's time to accept defeat and walk away. He gets another appraisal on his property, and despite his proximity to the concrete plant and invisibility from the main road, the economy and housing costs in Granby and the county have somehow raised Marvin's property value to $600,000. What the fuck? How did the assessors determine value in this area just by consulting a magic eight ball? Magic eight ball is Marvin's property worth, uh, I don't know, uh, 600 grand? Yes. <laughs> okay. Well, there you have it. Write it in the official paperwork. Thanks, magic eight ball. Uh, if Mark can get even 60% of that, that 600 grand, right? He can, he can still walk away ahead, you know, but, but can he let it all go? He needs to think about it. In the summer of 2002, now 50-year-old Marv caught in the grips of a real humdinger of a crisis. He's questioning how God could allow all this to happen to him. He's worked so hard. He's gone to church. He's prayed. And still he doesn't get away or get his way with his Granby muffler shop. Why God? Had the Dochefs prayed harder, longer, were they able to outpray him because there was more of them? I don't know exactly what he said to God, but I do know based on his audio recordings that he was having a spiritual crisis and angry at God. He started to think that maybe God wanted him to be the one to take down Granby's corruption. Maybe that was God's plan for him. Well, that's what mom was talking about all those years back. And then he felt like madmen often do that God spoke with him. And he starts thinking about destroying his enemy. He starts thinking about what big pieces of machinery God could help him modify into a weapon and it'd do quite a bit of destruction. In June 2002, divine inspiration and or mental illness leads him to Fresno, California to inquire about tractors. He pays $24,000 for a Komatsu D355A bulldozer. The bulldozer would be delivered to Colorado by the end of the month. He's really going to do this. God is urging him, he thinks, to make a killdozer because you know, <laughs> that sounds like something, uh, you know, an all-knowing, omnipotent, you know, being would absolutely do. You know, the God's up there. Just, Marvin Hemeyer, fall to your knees and listen. This is God. It is I, the Alpha and the Omega, the truth, the path, the immortal creator. And I know now what you must do to make things right in Granby. I need you to head to Fresno and get a bulldozer. Yes, that's the first part. That sounds right and godly. Then... When you get it, I need you to modify it with concrete and steel and leave some holes for rifles to shoot at people poorly. Also, I need you to knock down a bunch of buildings. Yes, nothing speaks to God's glory like an angry dude in a bulldozer turning a small town into rubble over some zoning disputes. Praise be to me. Go forth and bring glory to your God by personifying my eternal wisdom, by sitting inside a bulldozer and obliterating a hardware store and such. That is thine destiny. Fucking... Fucking ridiculous. These people think that God wants them to do this kind of shit. Uh, the bulldozer arrives in the July of 2002. Marvin puts it up for sale because now he wants to prove to himself that this is for sure God's will. This is what he thinks. Not kidding. He thinks if it doesn't sell, then God wants him to fucking take the town to the ground. <laughs> Makes a lot of sense. This guy is for sure not mentally ill. Um, he gets a bid for $20,000 for it, but that's under the $33,000 minimum he had set. So now he knows, okay, all right, it's God's plan. He's making a lot of good decisions. And then he puts, he does one more test just to be absolutely certain that God wants him to do this. He puts his land up for sale. He holds an auction. The minimum bid is set at $450,000 for his property appraised. Remember at 600 grand. He thinks if God, <laughs> he, he thinks, quote, God, if it sells at $450,000, I'm out of here. It doesn't sell, right? Oh, thank you, God. Thank you for making it so obvious that you clearly want me to destroy this stupid town. Praise be to God. I wonder what, what was said at that auction as well. We are opening the bid at $450,000 for a couple of curse takers with a sewer water hookups around by a concrete plan, a current side of muffler shop ran by a mentally unstable stubborn out of town or who just thinks he's we're going to work things out with the Doe Chef family. We know what he's had a good decade ago. If you don't buy this property today, Marvel almost immediately began modifying a bulldozer, nearly unstoppable machine of my hand will attack the town and misguided quest. Suppose he writes the judge think he's completely batch of crazy plan. All part of God's will. $450,000 going once, twice. No, takers, dear God, have mercy on our souls. Not sold. Get ready to be rumbled. Oh, man. Following the auction, Marvin is approached by Travis Bussey, who, though not interested in buying the muffler shop outright, is interested in renting it to gauge whether the shop would serve for the trash and recycling business he and his partner, Bob Martin, want to enter. 
Marv agrees to rent the shop to them with the understanding that the boat storage area will remain his. He needs it for God's plan. Marvin converts what the uh, what was his boat storage shed into a killdozer building facility. The 6,000 square feet building has a cement mixer and a lift affixed to one of the building's walls. The lift rises 15 feet above the floor, extends 20 feet. Marvin uses this lift to place the sections of steel on the bulldozer before using a welding torch to meld them to the tractor's body. It'll take him over a year to get this monster ready for its rampage. By the summer of 2003, Marvin is batshit fucking crazy. He is now spending a lot of nights sleeping in his killdozer facility. He's obsessed with vengeance. He's surprised no one has noticed that he's, uh, you know, uh, working on his machine yet. God must be watching out for him. God wants him to be a modern day Samson pushing down the pillars with his mighty killdozer, taking down the Philistines with him. Not being goofy here, he actually thinks this. Uh, when Bob and Travis' and sanitation employees move into the property, he starts working only at night so that no one will hear him, you know, weld and put this thing together like a bloodthirsty maniac. Around this time, the city moves to find him again, tells him that if he doesn't connect to the sewer, they're going to have to kick him out. He's going to have to vacate by July 28th, 2003, and he doesn't give a fuck. Uh, Marv uh, is, is hoping to have the death machine built by then, but the work turns out to be a lot harder than he thought it would be. It's not like he had a blueprint to work off of. Can't go to killdozer.com and grab schematics. No YouTube tutorials to watch. This crime could have not been more premeditated, by the way. Marv's obsession grows throughout the summer of 2003. He remains there past the deadline. They don't kick him out. Uh, he buys some two-by-fours and canvas and uses all this to construct for himself a little niche in the corner of his production facility where he can, you know, like his little, like, uh, condo inside of this place, even though he lives only a few miles away. In this corner, he moves into a single uh, body cot. He's got blankets, floor plan, space heater, wooden table, snacks, drinks, jugs of water, TV, VCR, videotapes, mini fridge. Uh, he works day and night, stopping only to rest, not shower, and remaining in the facility, pushing himself to keep going. He's fucking full Unabomber. In the fall, Marvin meets with Travis and Bob, you know, and the realtor at Chuck's Hole Cafe in Grand Lake. These are the guys from the sanitation company and discusses with them the possibility of buying the property, you know, of selling it to them. I can only imagine how wild-eyed and fucking crazy he must have looked over breakfast. <laughs> Sorry if I smell a little fellas. <laughs> a little busy lately preparing myself to be a mighty sword for God. <laughs> I'll cut this toe to the fucking ground. Oh, I will salt this place. Hey, can you actually, can you pass me the salt? Ah, oh, these hash browns are divine. Like the justice my killdozer will soon dole out upon Cody and Gus and the Philistines. Hey, have you tried this gravy? It's incredible. Uh, been a while since I ate something that wasn't cold and in a can and eaten feet away from a killdozer. Uh, Travis and Bob uh, know that Crazy Mars property, you know, they know what it's worth. And they actually offer him $550,000 for it. And he accepts. He sells it. After all this, he sells the property. And that's 400 fucking grand. Makes a ton of money. Right? This has got to be a sign that God's, you know, calling off his plan, right? Wrong. Nice try, Satan. <laughs> I see what you're trying to do there. Trying to sway me with your filth money. Too late, devil. No, Marv's plan is still in motion. Why? Because he is insane. He's completely insane. Around November of 2003, Meyer actually tells a few people what he's doing. After a few drinks at a local bar, one night he actually says, by God, I'm going to bulldoze this town. I'm guessing nervous laughter and a lot of awkward side glances ensue. On another day, he's eating breakfast at one of his favorite restaurants, El, Pas uh, El Pacifico in Grand Lake. The owner's name at the time was Maria Rios, and the two were friendly. She noticed uh, that he had started smoking again. She asked him why, and he said he was sick. Terminal cancer. She asked him, what are you going to do? And his answer was, and I quote, no one is going to get hurt. Uh, okay. Uh, she didn't know how to respond to that creepy statement, and she just bought him his meal and fucking stopped talking to him. He's starting to make people nervous. A bit later, Marvin hears from Harold Pelly, his old land manager, letting him know that back in Boulder, Doug Davis has abandoned the business. He doesn't give a shit. Uh, Pelly uh, actually also tells him that a man and wife, Jeff and Jennifer Sterling, were interested in buying the now uh, closed up property. And Marvin's like, fucking whatever. Just give it to him for 25 grand. Way under value. They jump at the opportunity. He doesn't need the money, right? He just made a bunch of money and he has no intention of living that much longer. In March of 2004, Marv's father dies. He drives to Castlewood for the funeral, meets up with his brother Ken and Ken's wife Cindy. Excuse me, his family didn't know what Marvin was planning, uh, nor of his canter, probably because he didn't have it. And they, and they uh, also didn't know that he had put nearly 500 grand into his father's estate to be distributed amongst his remaining family. He had also willed his cabin and more land to a friend named Bruner Schroeder, who curiously never appears, appears in his tale. And see, he has a lot of, lot of money, a lot of land to give to people. He's doing fine. 
Uh, Marv is making literally concrete plans to go out in a biblically inspired blaze of glory now. April 13th, 2004, Marv makes a tape, a bit of a manifesto that he tried to make a year earlier. Went into a lot of detail about his side of the story, and much of it has ended up in this episode. Uh, because the script keeper, Zach Flannery, head researcher, awesome counterpart to my research here, uh, one person uh, can only devote so many hours a week, so we doubled that shit a while back. Well, Zach, uh, he's a lot better than me this week when it comes to being able to uh, uh, dig through some of the source material. I, 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 I read a lot of stuff. I couldn't handle these goddamn audio tapes because it is a bunch of inane rambling, poorly recorded. Thank you, script keeper, for powering through. In the tape, Marr goes on and on about the injustices carried out against him by the city of Granby. He rants about a number of other things, including the conniving nature of Catholic people in general. Okay, totally unstable. He continues recording his manifesto on May 22nd, 2004. At one point, he says, this time I'm not walking away from it. I'll be dead when it's over, but that's my conviction. And then for the people out there that hear this, that can stand listening to it, I'm, I'm not one of them. Please pray for me. Pray for my soul. I believe that I'm doing the right thing. I don't think God would have let me get this far if it was the wrong thing. That is fucking dumb logic. People do all sorts of shit that God doesn't stop. See Hitler, Stalin, Joseph Fritzl, every serial killer in history. So much more. Then he says, anyway, hey, I hope you all had a, have a great time and a good life. I've had a great life. And it's Saturday morning, 22nd of May, 2004. And I want to put this tape and tape record in a plastic bag and someone else can try and figure it out. Well, we'll see you later. Oh boy, the rampage is near. Too bad local city officials didn't actually follow through on kicking him the fuck out of his property the summer before for that sewer hookup violation. If they would have been half as tyrannical as he claimed, this whole upcoming mess could have been avoided. June 3rd, 2004, the day before the rampage. Let's take a minute to really look at the beast that Killdozer was before we go into how Marvin used it. On the day before his infamous mechanical assault on the town of Granby, Marvin had to make sure everything was working perfectly with his machine. Marvin Hemeyer's project was a welder's work of art. Can't deny the dude had talent. The bulldozer turned urban tank was 32 and a half feet long, 12 and a quarter feet tall, but these dimensions were extended by layers of concrete and steel. Hidden by this armor was the word Komatsu, right? Embossed in white letters above the engine grill. His modified bulldozer was something straight out of a post-apocalyptic nightmare. Tracks and wheels and blade were that familiar yellow-orange color you always see around construction sites, but it's hydraulic components on the back underneath the ripper, its engine on the front, its cab on the top of the ripper. They've been all outfitted with shells of steel. Once the cab had been outfitted with two layers of steel, it created a pocket in between them. Marvin poured quickcrete to create an additional layer of motherfucking concrete that was about a foot thick. Good luck shooting through that. Marvin also had several cameras and monitors installed so he could see and he could build ports uh, to fire his guns out of. Even had some extra slim fast shakes. He loved his slim fast shakes in case he got hungry during the rampage inside. Not about to let some low blood sugar get in the way of his big day. His giant machine weighed 64 tons by the time it was finished. 128,000 pounds. Before his additions, it was 49 tons. He added 30,000 pounds of mostly armor. The Komatsu bulldozer is powered by a 410 horsepower engine, top road speed of just under uh, seven and a half miles an hour, horsepower of uh, per ton of 8.36. His modifications brought the horsepower per ton down to somewhere around 6.7, but still plenty mobile enough for what he needed it to do. He armed it with a 50 caliber Barrett M82 semi-automatic rifle at the rear, a Belgian FNFNC semi-automatic assault rifle poking out the front, had a 223 Ruger Mini 14 at the right. His two sidearms were a 357 Magnum revolver, a 9mm Keltec P11. These weapons could all be fired from small firing ports from inside the cabin. Cabin. He had lots of ammo. The cameras that allowed Hemeyer to see his surroundings were connected to three monitors protected by three-inch thick bulletproof plastic. The armored Komatsu bulldozer also had a sophisticated air filtration system and an air conditioning system. Onboard fans and an air conditioner were used to keep Hemeyer cool while driving, and compressed air nozzles were fitted to blow dust away from the video cameras. Unreal. Dude really did create a weapon that, you, as you can imagine, would damn near be impossible for a small-town police force to stop, especially back in 2004. Now let's move on to the big show. June 4th, 2004, Hemeyer kicks off his day of reckoning by driving his armored killdozer through the wall of his former business. Dramatic. 
Then the concrete plant, right? Tries to just go around the concrete plant and just knock down all the fucking walls to it. The town hall, the office of the local newspaper that Patrick Brower worked at, the home of a former judge's widow, hardware store owner by another man he Meyer named in a lawsuit, as well as several others. Shot at local police, apparently uh, shot at Cody Docheff. Holy shit, man. Can you imagine how satisfying it must have felt for him to smash up Docheff's concrete plant, though? I so wish we had audio recordings of what Marvin said inside of his uh, bulldozer during his final hours. Right? Like the first three Die Hard movies had already come out. You know he yelled, yippee ki motherfucker! Like at least two or three times. And since the first Terminator movies had also already come out, he had to have said, I'll be back. And then backed over something he'd already bulldozed at least once. And maybe, just maybe, at some point during the rampage, as he drove through town to smash the next building, he's saying, taking it to the street, taking it to the street, taking it to the street, taking it to the streets. Come on. He could have sang a little Triple M. Uh, the rampage would last two hours and seven minutes, destroy 13 buildings, knock out natural gas service to City Hall and the concrete plant, damage a police truck, part of a utility service center, and destroy numerous police dec decoy vehicles. In addition to other property damage, despite the damage, no one besides Hemeyer was killed. The final cost of the damage estimated it's between seven and $10 million. According to the Grand County Commissioner, James Newbury, Grand County emergency dispatchers used the reverse 911 emergency system to notify residents and property owners of the rampage going on in town. Get the hell out of there. Defenders of Hemeyer have contended that Marvin made a point of not hurting anybody during his bulldozer rampage. Ian Daughtry, a bakery owner, said Hemeyer went out of his way not to harm anyone. Everybody else had a different view. Right? The Sheriff's Department argues that uh, the fact that no one was injured, uh, it was not due to good intent, but due a lot to luck and due to their preventative measures. Hemeyer fired 15 bullets from his rifle at power transformers and propane tanks. According to the Sheriff's Department, had one of those tanks ruptured and exploded, anyone within one half mile of the explosion could have been endangered. Within such a range were 12 police officers and residents of a senior citizens complex and would have been a whole hell of a lot more other people if they hadn't been evacuated. The Sheriff's Department also asserts that Hemeyer fired many bullets from his semi-automatic rifle at Cody Doshev. Uh, Cody Doshev uh, tried to stop the assault on his concrete bash plant. Check this shit out. By going head-to-head -head with the killdozer with another tank-sized vehicle, a front-end loader, that ended up being pushed aside by Hemeyer's bulldozer. Again, uh, super fucked up. I wish we had audio of that. What was he saying when he was, when he was going head-to-head -head against Dochev, his mortal enemy in some kind of dystopian bumper car rally? Maybe a little Princess Bride? My name is Negro Montoya. You killed my father. Prepare to die. My name is Marvin Hemeyer. You cost me muffler money. Prepare to be killdozed. Uh, later, Hemeyer fired on two state patrol officers before they fired at him. The Sheriff's Department also notes that 11 of the 13 builders Hemeyer bulldozed were occupied moments before the destruction. At the town library, for example, a children's program was in progress when this shit started. There could have been casualties if local emergency responders wouldn't have stepped up to the plate and done their jobs. And it probably would have been. One officer dropped a flashbang grenade down the bulldozer's exhaust pipe with no immediate effect. A local and state patrol, including a SWAT team, walked behind and beside the bulldozer, occasionally firing. But the armored bulldozer was impervious to their shots. Attempts to disable the bulldozer's cameras with gunfire failed. That bullet-resistant plastic did its job. And at one point during the rampage, under Sheriff Glenn Trainer, a man who we will hear from soon, you can watch uh, if you watch on YouTube, managed to climb atop the bulldozer and ride the bulldozer, quote, like a bronc buster, trying to figure out a way to get the bullet inside the dragon. However, he was eventually forced to jump off to avoid being hit with debris. And again, we'll talk to this awesome man in just a few minutes. Uh, at this point, uh, you know, local authorities, or while it was happening, while it started, and the Colorado State Patrol feared they were running out of options in terms of firepower and that Hemeyer would soon turn against civilians. Then Governor uh, Bill Owens considered authorizing the National Guard to utilize either an AH-64 Apache attack helicopter equipped with AGM-114 Hellfire missiles or a two-man fire team equipped with an FGM-148 Javelin anti-tank missile to destroy the bulldozer. That option was later deemed unnecessary due to Hemeyer getting stuck in the Gamble's hardware store and glad they didn't have to pull that trigger. If they would have sent a helicopter after him, he'd have even more fans on the internet. More on that soon. As of 2011, those on Governor Owen's staff uh, vehemently denied that such a course of action was ever considered. However, members of the state patrol have since confirmed that the option was considered. The governor ultimately decided against it due to the hypothetical collateral damage of a missile strike. 
Finally, the rampage ends in a hardware store. Two problems arise as Hemeyer destroys the Gamble's hardware store. The radiator of his killdozer had been damaged and the engine was leaking various fluids. And the Gambles had a small basement. The bulldozer's engine failed and Hemeyer dropped one tread into the basement and he couldn't get out. About a minute later, one of the SWAT team members who had swarmed around the machine reported hearing a single gunshot from inside the cab. It was later determined that Hemeyer had shot himself in the head with his 357 caliber handgun. Police first used explosives in an attempt to remove the steel plates, but after the third explosion failed, they cut through them with an oxy, oxyacetylene cutting torch. Uh, Grand County Emergency Management Director Jim Hollihan stated that the authorities weren't able to access and remove Hemeyer's body until 2 a.m. the following morning, June 5th. He really built this thing to be impenetrable. On April 19th, 2005, it was announced that Hemeyer's bulldozer was being taken apart for scrap metal. Individual pieces were dispersed to many separate scrapyards to prevent admirers of Hemeyer from taking souvenirs. And that takes us out of today's Time Suck timeline. Good job, soldier. You've made it back. Barely. And that, my friends, is the story of, of Killdozer, but not the whole story. To understand it further, let's get some extra firsthand details with uh, one of the bravest officers I've ever heard of, Glenn Trainer, Dude who mounted that fucking tank. Little disclaimer on this interview. Due to the production process required to kick out these in-depth research, research podcasts week after week, and with a personal workload that includes another week, uh, weekly you know, story-based podcast, Scared to Death, weekly Patreon podcast, Secret Suck. Uh, writing a new, you know, hour of stand-up comedy all the time, touring on that, that hour, being a dad, husband, et cetera. Challenging to look forward past the current week's suck. So I didn't have the prep time I wanted for Glenn's interview, and I, and I messed up his daughter's name. Sorry, Jordan. Jordan. I know your name is Jordan, not Sydney. Uh, she set up this interview, and I'm eternally grateful, and I'll be forever sorry for referring to you as Sydney. No idea where that came from. Also, I had to conduct this interview based on my schedule before diving into this week's suck material. Had I known everything I know now, I would have asked a few different questions. That being said, I still think this interview adds a lot to the suck and I'm grateful for Glenn's time because he doesn't give many interviews, as you'll hear. I thank Nimrod for convincing him to join us. Hope you like this edition. Don't come to expect it. I don't have the time to pull out these interviews every week. Uh, that, all that being said, Glenn Trainer, everyone. Well, Glenn, thank you so much uh, again for, for joining me here. And uh, yeah, really appreciate your, your daughter putting me in touch with you and getting some insight into the stories, especially this one, because I feel like this, uh, this story really needs some insight because yeah, I definitely have a lot of questions after looking around on the internet about what actually happened back in 2004. Yes, it was a crazy day and I'd be happy to talk to you about it. And, and what was your position now? Uh, when this, when this all went down, it was yeah, June 4th, 2004. Uh, you were working in law enforcement at that time, correct? I was, I was the Grand County Undersheriff. Oh, okay. Grand County Under Sheriff, and then uh, Glenn, and it's Glenn Trainer who we're who we're talking to. Glenn, what is your position now? I'm the chief of police for the towns of Fraser and Winter Park, Colorado, which is also in Grand County. Oh, okay, okay, wow. So yeah, so you really were heavily involved in this story with Marvin Hemeyer. I was. Now, um, where were you when it happened? Were you on duty? I was on duty, but uh, as the Under Sheriff, I was the chief administrative officer for the sheriff's office. So I was actually working at the sheriff's office in Hot Sulphur Springs, which is about 10 miles from Granby where this happened. When, when did you get the call that uh, Marvin had, you know, taken his modified bulldozer and, and started to destroy property? Well, the, the original call came in as a 911 call that there was a bulldozer out of control uh, at, the, uh, at the concrete batch plant there in Granby. Uh, Mountain Parks Concrete, it's called. Yeah. And, uh, and so my, my initial thoughts were is that because they had a lot of heavy equipment there, that somebody had been working on a piece of this heavy equipment, had fallen off of it, had gotten off of it, had got into gear. Right. And it was just dragging around willy-nilly destroying things. Oh, so, so at first, uh, you guys didn't know that it was a weapon, like uh, when you first heard about it. That's correct. I, I think something probably got lost in the translation from the original 911 call sure. to when the second one came in saying, hey, there's a there's a bulldozer, it's all armored up, and it is tearing down the entire facility. How long did it take you to uh, determine th who the driver was? Well, um, initially, 
we didn't know. And, uh, and then I think within just a few moments of arriving on scene, it, I was probably on scene within 12 or 13 minutes. Wow. Um, then somebody said, well, this is probably Marvin Hemeyer. And uh, as soon as I heard that name, then I knew that, that uh, um, all the bad blood that had happened between the town of Granby and Mr. Hemeyer. Yeah. And, um, and so I, uh, you know, we then initiated um, evacuation uh, protocols and that sort of thing because um, I knew that things had not ended well with him. Yeah. And uh, he was probably, uh, you know, hell bent for destruction at that point. And, and had, had he been kind of reclusive in the months leading up to this event? He had. He had at one time owned a, uh, a muffler shop in Granby. And in fact, most everybody that lived in, in town had, had work done on his, uh, in his shop and that sort of thing. Yeah. And, uh, and even me. And uh, so he sold that business and uh, unbeknownst to us had rented a storage uh, building, basically a big metal building, just kind of across the alleyway from, from where his muffler shop was. And, uh, you know, he just spent the, the, basically the next 14, 16 months in there building this bulldozer, wow. uh, that was cased in armor. So, so you actually were a customer of his. I was. Yeah. Oh, okay. I, I, yeah, I, I didn't expect that for some reason, I guess, but it's a small town. It is. Right. So yep, it, and, and I had actually on behalf of the town of Granby, because uh, the sheriff's office contracted for law enforcement services, actually issued him a summons for a zoning violation he had there for not cleaning up his junk. And but, you know, it was a very amicable conversation with Marv all the time with us. Uh, he never gave me any problems, was always friendly to me. And wow. And, uh, you know, his big issue was with the town of Granby. And ultimately it was determined that he had issues with with a whole bunch of folks in town. Yeah. And that's, yeah. And that's what I was going to ask you, you know, about if you, if you had had interactions with him before, how he seemed, if he seemed disgruntled, if he was, you know, cantankerous or confrontational, but you, you, you say he was a pretty amicable guy in your experience before all this happened. Yeah, he was, at least with us, he was. Now I had been present at several Granby town board meetings right. where he had argued with them about, uh, his dispute with the town. And, uh, and that and and uh but you know he was never out of line at a board meeting never um uh, you know the police were never called because he was disorderly or anything like that so okay. you know like most disputes it appeared that he had handled everything on it with an adult manner or in an adult manner now if, if now the dispute itself i had some questions about because you know you, you go to 10 different sources online and you kind of get 10 different versions of the story but it, but essentially, it sounds like I believe it was 1992. He had purchased some land and got a pretty good deal. I want to say around, just off the top of my head, f between forty and fifty thousand dollars. He bought uh, some some commercial land uh, in the town there, and then had apparently maybe made a deal to sell some of that land or sell all of that land to that mountain. Uh, what is it? Mountain. I have the name right now. Mountain Park Concrete. Mountain Park Concrete. Yes. Yeah, and and then the, there was a price disagreement. There was, and, and see, he originally bought that land at an FDIC auction. Okay. It had been originally owned by the same guy that owned the Mountain Parks Concrete. Okay. And so he bought it at an FDIC auction, and then at some point, uh, you know, after he had some troubles with the town and that, uh, he objected to them building this big batch plant there and, uh, and then sold the land. And I'm not aware of the entire dispute. Right. But I know ended up with him having bad blood with the owner of Mountain Parks Concrete. Yeah, I know it, it seems to be, and there's, you know, again, different versions, but it seems to be uh, about an easement. And, and, uh, and I've read different accounts of that where some, some, you know, it seems like some people believe that he, the access to his business was blocked by this concrete works, uh, you know, lo location. But then when I've dug a little farther, it seems like actually he, people were able to still get to him just fine. And it seems yes. like, like there was a problem with, uh, a lot of people seem to think that he was mostly angry over how much it would cost to connect his property to the city for water and sewer. 
Did you? That's correct. Okay, that's correct. Okay, and did that come yeah. up in those town meetings then? From what I understand, um, you know, I don't remember. Yeah, it's been a lot of years. Being now. a big issue, but I know that he was upset, and of course, um, he was really upset because of the town when when they did the special use plan or the special use permit for this concrete batch plant. Yeah. That they originally didn't follow the correct procedures. And of course he brought it to their attention. And so they started the whole thing over again, did right. it right the second time. And he felt like because they didn't do it right the first time, they shouldn't get to do it. Oh, okay. I mean, if, I mean, it seems, it seems like, um, you know, we all have our own kind of ideas of, of how things should go in life and our own kind of moral codes, it, it does seem like this is a situation where it, it could have easily been just let go at numerous points. Oh, but, sure. But he, it seems like he's uh, kind of fixated on this one possibly kind of minor infraction and then just let it snowball in his mind for reasons that uh, I don't know if anyone will, will ever understand. I mean, have you reflected on it in the years since? And do you think there's... Was, was there any case for him to be even remotely as angry as he was? Well, I, you know, I think just as adults living in society, not everything goes our way. Right. You know, and, right. And so, you know, as an example, I had a vacant lot next to my house that they came in, put a modular in. Okay. I didn't want it there. But on the other hand, it's not worth me losing sleep over. You know? <laughs> right. And, right. And I think that's the way most adults react to these kind of yeah. things. You know, he eventually sued the town and uh, I believe Cody Docheff in district court, which right. he lost. And um, and I think it just became, an, like you said, an absolute obsession for him to where that was all he was thinking about and really um, all he was focused on. And at some point he just decided he was going to get his revenge. Yeah. You know, and, and a lot of people online seem to frame kind of the narrative of this story as, you know, the underdog or the little guy versus, quote unquote, the man versus you know, city hall versus some kind of oppressive, tyrannical government. You know, I'm from a small town and, uh, you know, sometimes uh, certain positions in government are, are almost more like local government, more uh, honorary positions. And uh, it, it's not this big machine that can just do, you know, impose its will on people. Uh, right. I I mean, <laughs> I'm just trying to think even how to, how to ask this question, but I mean, is there, is there any truth at all to like this 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 guy being a martyr to this guy like standing up to the system, or I mean, did he actually have any any kind of uh, legitimate beef? I mean, it doesn't seem like he did. It doesn't seem like I, I, I'm just curious why people want to make him this kind of hero. Uh, well, like I have wondered that many times as well. I've seen a lot of the stuff on YouTube and right. and the blog posts and that kind of thing and. You know, the truth was, is this guy basically was a criminal. Right. By the time he got done, he engaged in criminal acts that endangered hundreds of people's lives, as well as law enforcement officers. And yeah, and I really don't have any sympathy for him. Right. He fought. He fired on law enforcement, correct? Uh, yes, he did. Yeah, because that's a that's a big uh, yeah. Yeah, he fired on law enforcement, and at one point during uh, during his initial assault on the concrete batch plant. There were uh, three state troopers that were hiding behind some concrete barricades, yeah. and uh, and he saw them there and went uh, went over and tried to push those concrete barricades on top of them. Wow! So, so yeah, I I, I absolutely uh, I just don't buy into that. You know that the man had put him down or kept him down and right. kept him from living his life because because that's just not true. And that's and, an, uh, yeah. And if I can say something else, is yeah. I, I think the uh, I think a lot of people on the internet uh, feel, or the rumor is, is that because of town government, he was left broke and penniless and without right. business. And he was worth over a million dollars. Oh, was he uh, really? Yes, and and uh, you know he had gained a tremendous amount of money from the sale of of his business, uh, as well as other assets, and he owned a home up in Grand Lake which is kind of a tourist community. And, okay. and so, you know, his net worth was, was over a million dollars. So it was not like he was broken penniless. Right. Right. And, and, and I like that you brought up that, uh, that thing with the barricade, because part of the narrative that I see in the comments left under a lot of videos on YouTube is that he didn't try to hurt anybody that he, you know, made this effort to just destroy the property of the people who had wronged him. 
and that, you know, he, he never tried to hurt anyone. And that does not seem to be true because he did fire on people. And yes. like, like you said, you know, he did this with the concrete barricade, tried to push it over on officers. And I'm picturing the, the type of concrete barricade I'm picturing in my head, it would have likely killed them if it would have, oh, you know, absolutely it would have. Yeah. right, right. Yeah. And, and then there was other things I saw, like, uh, he, you know, the, the, how the home of the mayor or, or the man who was the mayor when he was had this dispute not go his way. Uh, I, I read also that one of the homes he destroyed was this man had, had died and it was his widow living in the home and, yes. and, and an older widow, which to me doesn't yes. speak of some kind of hero when you are, you know, essentially demolishing the home of, of a, of a helpless, you know, uh, older woman who had nothing to do with this interaction. That's correct. And, and I wondered, I mean, do you think he was mentally ill when this happened? Um, you know, clearly he had some obsession about this. Right. But, um, you know, I, I just, I don't think mental illness to where he wasn't responsible for his actions because he okay. didn't know the difference between right and wrong. Yeah. I mean, anybody yeah. who would do this probably has some mental illness, but I think he very clearly knew what he was doing. Right. There was a, especially with this particular crime, a lot of premeditation. I mean, it took so right. much planning. And, right. and and I also wonder, you know, when there's this narrative of, you know, the little guy versus the system, well, the town is full of a lot of other just regular citizens and residents who interacted with this guy, who knew him, who were customers of him. After this was all said and done, what was the town's reaction to what he did? Did anybody think what he did was legitimate? To your you know, knowledge? The, there was one person who was also a little bit of a wingnut in the community. <laughs> Uh, we had a uh, just kind of a community memorial or something like that where people got up and talked about, you know, we're going to recover from this. Everything's going to be fine. You know, we love you all, that kind of thing. Yeah. And this guy got up and, and basically said that, uh, that Marv was, was justified in doing what he, what he did. And, and uh, you know, I, I thought we were going to have to escort him out of that. Oh, wow. Venue under armed guard, people were so angry with him. So, and when the people who were angry, was it was it uh, primarily the people who had lost property, or was it, or did it really seem to be the town in general, or at least the people who came to that memorial in general, seemed to be on the side of the people who had lost property and damage, seemed to be against him. Oh, it was the entire community okay. that that was against this guy. I mean, uh, you know, and it really was being a, a town of about two thousand people. Right. I mean, it affected in some way every single person in the community. And I feel like that gets lost to this narrative too, because if it really was some situation where this guy had been wronged by the powers that be, and he, you know, got some revenge, I would just logically think that there would be support for that guy in the community that he did that, you know, where he did that. But that does not seem to be the case uh, you're saying at all. That's absolutely true. Yeah. What you're saying is true. Okay. Okay. How, and, and you talk about the, 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 the damage, you know, again, a, a town of 2000 people, I mean, he did significant property damage. How long did it take the town to uh, recover economically or, you know, financially from all that devastation? Well, I, I think, you know, initially there was basically the mitigation of all the damage, taking away all the damaged buildings and that kind of thing. And, uh, and by and large, I think overall in in the end of it, it was really a good thing for the town yeah. because it started the community revitalization and that sort of thing. You know, some of the buildings that were torn down were replaced with nicer facilities and that kind of thing. But, right, right. But I, it probably took a couple of years before the, the town was fully recovered from it. And, uh, you know, the one of the guys who had his, uh, his hardware store totally demolished by this guy, right. um, it took him several years before he was able to rebuild in that because wow. he was sure insured and, and he really did lose almost everything in that. Oh, wow. So this guy who had the hardware store, uh, where you say he was underinsured and, and, and just, yeah. oh yes. man. So, and that, and that guy, why the hardware store? Do you have any recollection of, of why was that attacked? Because, um, the gentleman that owned the hardware store, um, his name is Casey Farrell. Uh, he actually had been on the town board during the time when all this stuff was going on, all these, these okay. conflicts. And, and I imagine, I mean, if, if you're on the town board in uh, a town with a population of about 2,000 people, it's not like this was this guy was some kind of fat cat getting rich off, you know, local government <laughs> corruption. 
I mean, is that even a paid position? Oh, I think they got at that time something like two hundred and fifty dollars a month, or or something <laughs> like that. You know, and and, and uh, you know, it was it was really a volunteer job more than anything. Right, right, and I think that's an, an important detail to have in this story. Again, for the people who want to paint him as this kind of hero. You know, it, sometimes it feels like in their minds, it's this poor guy. But as you were saying earlier, you know, a guy worth over a million dollars, actually. But it seems like the narrative gets painted. He's this poor, you know, little disenfranchised guy. And the, and the town had taken everything from him. And you can picture like these almost like out of a bad movie. You know, the, these guys, you know, uh, eating big steak dinners and smoking cigars and patting each other on the back. Right. And money, <laughs> money's getting tossed around when, in fact, it's a very small town. These are local business owners. You know, I'm sure they probably didn't get a, give a second thought to this ordinance. You know, he wasn't correct. Move on to the next thing so I can get right. back home and uh, right. get a little sleep before I got to open the hardware store. Right. And, and then this guy paints them as this, you know, crazy regime out to get him. I right. mean, I, I mean, a quote that gets attributed with him a lot is uh, sometimes reasonable men do unreasonable things. I see that on memes from Marvin. Yes. I, mean, I got to say, he doesn't seem reasonable. He doesn't seem like no. he was a reasonable man. No, not at all. Uh, w w after this happened, uh, how did it affect uh, you know your life? Were you getting lots of interview requests from like you know media outlets? Oh sure, yeah. It's there's been just tons of those, and and uh, you're actually the uh, one of the only ones I've done in the last year or so, just because you know I've been reached out to by people from other countries. And, oh wow, and thing and and at some point, you know, it it was. It was incredibly traumatic for me because these people, you know, were all my friends that were hurt in this. And, yeah. and uh, you know, and, and plus, uh, you know, being around something like that, uh, that bulldozer while it's firing rounds, tearing down buildings, it was fairly traumatic. So, I bet. you know, I, I'm not saying I was traumatized as much as some of these private citizens were, right. but all the law enforcement and first responders that day were all pretty much shell-shocked by the time the day was over. Well, I mean, were were you shot at personally in this incident? You know, I was not. Uh, I don't know if my daughter told you, but uh, I actually climbed on top of the bulldozer. And yeah, yeah. Really it down in that, and and uh, but you know, just being a, wow. I was personally shot at, but I was certainly there when he started firing at at the uh, the bulk storage propane tanks. Uh, yeah. In, down, you know, and 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 of course, had one of those gone up. You know, it would probably have killed dozens, if not hundreds, of people. Wow! Now, now, oh man, that that's a yeah, that's a crazy thing to to point out there too. That yeah, that that many people would have died if he would have been successful in his attempt to explode yes. those propane tanks. And Sydney did tell me about your climbing up on uh, the tank. How did that come about? Well, after he got done at the batch plant, um, you know, I was really thinking, and of course, you know, being civilian police officers. We don't have the kind of armament that you would need to disable something like this. Right. You don't yeah. have anti-tank weaponry. Uh, That's correct. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, we don't have air-to-ground missiles or anything like that. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and, uh, and so, uh, you know, I just started thinking about a situation that had happened in San Diego several years prior where a guy actually stole a, stole a regular tank. Yeah. And around, and, and the way the law enforcement stopped that was they actually climbed on top of it, found the hatch that goes inside of it and uh, opened it up and shot and killed a guy. And, and I thought, well, you know, he had to get in there some way. And so right. I thought uh, I could get on top of the thing. I would probably be able to find a hatch and open it. And he was either going to surrender or he was going to die at that point. Wow. Wow. I mean, how, how, uh, how, I mean, nerve wracking was that for you? I mean, I imagine that had to have been a very atypical kind of day for you uh, working in Granby where, I don't imagine there's a lot of violent crime in this sense. I'm sure domestic violence, those things. Sure. But this sure. has to be just on an, I would imagine probably on a different level than anything you'd experienced before in the area. Oh, it was. It was It was so far beyond my ability to comprehend, you know. I mean, it, yeah. was, it was really shocking to, to see this thing in operation. And like I said, you know, with our civilian weapons, we have handguns, patrol right. rifles, things like that. And and when I stepped around the corner and saw that thing, I was just like, we're in for a long day because we don't have anything that'll stop this. Wow. Wow. Uh, you know, your daughter also told me, um, 
And, and it's been, you know, I saw her and first heard about this. It's been a little over a year, but I remember talking mm -hmm. to her after the show and she said she was laughing about, um, she was angry at the situation because I believe her, it was either homecoming or prom pictures were lost in some kind of vehicle destruction. Do yes. You, do you remember that yeah. was, was that, her, I'm trying to remember, was that her car or your car? No, it was my car. I had parked it alongside one of the buildings at the batch plant. Right. And he was slowly, methodically working his way around the batch plant and destroying the walls on the thing, trying to get wow. it to collapse. And, and so when he came around, he saw my car, he began pushing it with this bulldozer. And it went down into just a, just a little ditch or whatever. And then he went right over the top of it. And, and it, was a, it was a big Ford Expedition. And yeah. it was probably about two and a half feet tall when he got done. Wow. So that, so that, was, your, that was your squad car, right? I mean, yes. uh, now, man. Uh, and, and how did it affect the, the law enforcement in the area? Because you guys lost, uh, I mean, other cars as well, right? And, and then uh, had uh, considerable property damage. Yeah, the, uh, the only car we actually lost that was in our fleet was that one. Oh, just, um, oh okay. I thought it was, okay. Yeah, the, there were some old police cars that the town of Granby used as like decoy police vehicles to put on the street or whatever. Oh, yeah, okay. Those were parked at the town hall and those all got destroyed but but those weren't in our fleet oh those are the pictures i saw okay so yes. yeah, yeah okay okay um man it, it, if you could go back and talk to this guy like if like if you know if for you caught wind that he was planning something what, what what would you say to him you know like is there anything you know i i think just given that the whole narrative around uh domestic terrorism and Right. And Homeland Security has changed significantly since that time. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I would really hope that we would have a way to, to gain intelligence, um, you know, and and really kind of make a preemptive move against this guy. Right. As opposed to uh, as opposed to just back in those days. I mean, you know, there was just that those kind of resources just did not exist. And and, you know, to to think that we just never had an idea that that somebody that angry uh, right. would do something like that. And of course, these days, you know, we'd probably be reaching out to some of our federal partners who really have a lot more resources than we had at the time. Right. You know, that that's there's a big argument. You know, I'm I'm somewhat you know uh, libertarian, probably my political you know leanings. But I but I don't take it as far as certain others where right. you know. Uh, I, I, I think I, I do think in terms of safety where, mm -hmm. yes, you know, you want to be free, but at the same time, you know, when people think about like, oh, well, do you want your shopping list monitored? Me personally, it actually doesn't really bother me because I'm not trying to hide anything. I'm, I'm not right. building you know, uh, pipe bombs in my garage right. or, or things right. like that, you know, and, and I mean, cause it is scary to think that without those, you know, uh, advantages or abilities to be able to kind of, you know, su survey on, on some level that, you know, where a lot of people are focused on international terrorism. I, I actually get more worried about, you know, like what, what could the guy down the street do or somebody I that agree. just has an, yeah, an agenda, some kind of vendetta yeah. and, and, you know, and they're able to take various chemicals and I mean, like, like what this guy did, you know, what if he could have gotten those propane tanks? What if he could have made some explosives as well? I mean, somebody with the right skill set could do significant damage and, and take out, you know, a, a lot of lives. And so I'm, yeah, I'm, I guess I'm just saying I'm with, I'm with you there, you know, where, you know, this, this situation as bad as it was, could have been so, so, so much worse. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. And, uh, and I think, you know, going, kind of going back to your original question, sorry, I sidetracked you, but no. I think I would just talk to him and, and just say, you know, whatever you're doing, it's wrong. You know, they, these people are not worth this and, right. and, uh, Try to appeal to his his um, sense of humanity as opposed to, you know, just the incredible anger that he had. Yeah, you know, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. You know, just yeah, exactly to appeal to his humanity and just like you said, it's not worth it. You know, I, I read a bunch of comments right before I uh, did this interview with you of people who are you know clearly big supporters of him, and they kept mm -hmm. tossing around words like um, like bravery and and courageous. Right. And, and I don't personally see it where to me, I think sometimes the brave or the courageous thing is just to walk away, you know, that where they just think like, well, good for him for taking this fight. But like you said, it's, is the fight worth it? And in this case, right. I don't know how any rational person 
could see his actions as being justified for at most a zoning dispute. Right. I mean, it's, 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 I, I was really shocked. I was really shocked when I looked at the comments, you know, um, you know, we've been busy kind of recording some other things this week and I, you know, I'm always kind of week to week on recording things and I don't have always the time I want to look into a topic heavily well in mm -hmm. advance. And right. so this morning when I started looking into this, I honestly expected, you know, the comments to be like, why did this guy do this? Oh, right. he was crazy. And I was pretty sad actually to see, it is. yeah, the majority of the comments were like, what a hero. Um, a lot of comparisons to the founding fathers standing up to the British, mm -hmm. you know, it's like, right. Right. He wasn't the victim of tyrannical oppression. You know, he just didn't have a zoning dispute go his way. Right. And he flattened the town. And I have to think he must have known this wasn't going to end well for him. I, I mean, I, I, I would think. Do you, have you had any thoughts that way? Do you think any part of him thought he would live through this? Oh, I, I absolutely believe that he knew he was not going to live through it one way or the other. Um, you know, he just given the camera system he had set up inside that. And then, uh, you know, kind of his manifesto that he had put on tape and sent out to, yeah. to various people and, and the recordings he had made. And, and right. in, uh, in the garage where he built this thing, this big metal building, he had uh, written on the wall, uh, you know, comparing himself to like Samson or not Samson, but uh, uh, yeah, Samson. Yeah, yeah. And then when, when Samson died, he killed himself and you know, like 2000 Philistines at the same time. And, and so I, I think he very well knew that he wasn't going to, going to exit that, uh, that thing. And, and, uh, living proof of that is that he had actually bolted himself inside that. Oh, so there was no, there was no getting out of that. Wow. So like his final yeah. act of welding was to enclose himself in this. Well, he, he had used bolts, which I guess he could have. Oh yeah. Uh, so, but, but nevertheless, I, you know, that he had a, he had firearms inside that uh, with him, which, you know, he obviously took his own life with. But, uh, yeah, he uh, I'm very convinced that he was not going to leave that alive. And he knew that when he got in it and started it up. Did, did, did any laws change because of uh, what happened that day in uh, Granby that you know of? Uh, not that I know of, um, you know, but I, I do think that, you know, that there was a change in the in the mayor not too long after that. There was a. A uh, change in some of the town board, and incidentally, my wife was on the town board when this happened. Yeah, you know, and uh, but I think there was a just a general move to to maybe be a little more user friendly in in local governments to people. Okay, you know, and, and which I I think just small communities to to keep those relationships strong. You you have to be user friendly. Yeah, you, know, you may not give somebody the answer they want, but but you have to have a relationship with people and be willing to sit down and talk to them about the problems they're having or whatever, and try and work that through with them, no matter what. That's yeah, that's great. That's, that's a great lesson for just, uh, you know, just communities in general, government, non-government alike, you know, yep. just, uh, yep. just for people in general where, I mean, you know, you, you can be as nice as possible and every once in a while, you're still going to get somebody who is just completely unreasonable and, and you right. just can't help that. But I bet there are a lot of people on the fence where, you know, if they are talked to in a very kind of civil, nice, you know, polite way, they might not kind of teeter off that ledge right. and, and, and do something like the, you know, that Glenn did. So that's just, yeah, that's a really, yeah. man, just communication, just talk and, uh, yeah, small towns, big cities, all of that. Yes. Yeah. Well, yeah. uh, I mean, that's, that's really kind of, uh. I mean, all I have, I, 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 thanks for your, thanks for being so courageous. I mean, oh, no that, th that day and what you did, I mean, not everybody would be willing to climb up on that tank. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that is true. Not everybody's that stupid. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that's pretty courageous. Uh, yeah. uh, and, uh, and I, and I really, um, yeah, thanks. Thank your daughter. I'll, I'll, uh, you know, for, for putting us in touch and oh, sure. yeah, it's very nice to meet you and. And uh, if you have any other questions or whatever, just reach out to me. I don't mind at all. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. I, uh, I am prepared to get some uh, some backlash from this episode because I okay I, I don't think the narrative I'm going to have uh, with this one is 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 close to what the people in the comment section on YouTube seem to have. Right. So, but uh, but I th I think the the a more accurate version of this story needs to get out there. Where yeah, that's true, and I, and I think if you just look at our world and our country today and the the conspiracy theories that 
fly around so freely. You know, I think there's just a lot of people who read only what they want to and believe only what they want to. And yeah, and you now and it just kind of builds into this momentum. And and I, uh, you know, I feel bad for them that they're not willing to look look at the facts and right. you know, kind of look at the big picture before they form their decisions. So, uh, so even though you uh, you work for the government, you're saying you're not uh, part of the Illuminati. I am not. <laughs> I'm just a guy that comes to work every day. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for coming to work every day. And thanks for uh, working in law enforcement and keeping the rest of us safe. All right, sir. Thank you very much. It's nice to talk to you. Thanks, Glenn. Okay. Bye. Bye. Oh, Glenn Trainer, What a good dude. And again, Jordan, not Sydney. I hate myself sometimes. What a class act Glenn was for not pointing that out. And what a great dude. Yeah, yeah, just a great dude. Jordan uh, says he's also an amazing dad. Love him. Vote Glenn Trainer, 2020. I don't think he's running for anything. He's not that I know of, but if he decides to run for something, yeah, you'd probably vote for him. Uh, sorry if some of that info was redundant. Again, had to conduct the interview before researching the suck. Only had about two hours to kind of prep. Crammed hard for those two hours, but two hours is still two hours. But I, uh, I love that he did that. I like that Glenn pointed out how much Marvin was worth when he died. Over a million dollars, right? The narrative that he was this poor, helpless little guy being beaten down by the powers that be, it's just not true. Whole mess started because he had more money to bid at the auction than the Dochev family, not less. Financially, he was very likely better off than any of the other characters in this story. I'm also glad we mentioned the former mayor's widow. How does smashing her house make this guy some hero, some revolutionary type figure? You know, what he did was a coward's move, or at least the move of a mentally disturbed man. Also glad how we, how we talked about how the residents of the town where all this occurred, those people did not view him as a hero after all this went down. That says a lot about Marvin Hemeyer. He, he was not this man of the people where the townspeople rejoiced in his attack against this corrupt government. Love that Glenn stressed talking to people when it comes to, uh, you know, uh, someone in the community struggling. Communication, man. It's so hard sometimes to talk things out, especially when dealing with the loose cannon. But it's so important, uh, especially important when dealing with the loose cannon, right? It sounds like Cody Dochev and Gus Harris may have been real assholes too in this situation. You know, my gut says they, they probably were assholes to Marvin. And, and if they had been cooler, less confrontational, communicated more effectively, this whole situation could have probably been avoided. Uh, as far as the privacy argument that Glenn brought up goes, man, that one's a tricky one for me. I, I don't have anything to hide. I also don't want the government spying on me, but I also don't want some other Marvin Hemeyer, someone with a psychological profile of a mall shooter plotting something that could end in the loss of my life and the loss of my kids' lives. Right? Privacy rights, real, real tricky issue. I don't know how much privacy we should be allowed to have. I really don't. I want to feel safe, but not at the expense of having no privacy. You know, I'm guessing we should, uh, I don't know. I guess, I'm guessing we'll probably get some cool updates from a lot of you pertaining to that exact debate. Uh, as far as the people I referred to in the interview who seem to think Marvin was a hero, and I've mentioned that throughout this episode, those folks leaving a lot of pro-Marv comments under videos on the web. Let's take a look at some of those comments now. Left by the conspiracy people that uh, Glenn, you know, mentioned in today's Idiots of the Internet. Of the internet. 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 This little section here is why I spent extra time trying to give lots of extra details. I hope it wasn't confusing. I myself got lost <laughs> over and over in the details of the story, but I just wanted to make it really crystal clear that Marvin Hemeyer was not an innocent victim um, getting fucked over by a corrupt local government. That it's a much more complicated story than that. And he was at fault in, in many ways throughout the story. You know, other people, yes, sharing the blame, but it wasn't this big bad town versus this poor little guy and they're just bankrupting him. That's not the, the truth, but that's what it appears to be on the internet. Uh, so much dif disinformation out on YouTube about this guy. It, it truly disgusts me how he's been made into the symbol of a fight against tyranny. This Marvin Hema, a true patriot, a brave, incredible example of a real American. No. Oh. After digging into this tale, I'm convinced that anyone who actually thinks that either doesn't know what the fuck they're talking about or is a huge asshole that just loves it with, uh, when any powers that be are destroyed. Actual anarchy is ridiculous. And anyone that claims to be truly, you know, that, that claims to truly, truly want zero government is either just, you know, talking tough because it sounds like some cool rebellious, I'm so dark and mysterious kind of shit to, stay, to say, or they really haven't thought the concept through. Or they're just not capable of thinking that concept through because maybe they're not the Sharpest knife in the drawer. All right. Not even Zach De La Roca from Rage Against the Machine hates all politicians. Just the corrupt ones. Government is necessary. I don't like it all the time. 
don't like a lot about it. I have way more anarchistic tendencies inside me than I think the average person has. Some days I want to burn it all, you know, to the ground myself, but deep down, I know that rules are necessary to have a civilization and that civilization is better than anarchy. As much as I, uh, you know, uh, don't have a lot of faith in the average politician to make choices for me, I have less faith in my neighbors still being good people in a world with no loss. Uh, for this video, I choose an upload of some of, or I've chosen an upload of some of Marvin's manifesto audio, the Marvin Hemeyer tapes uploaded by Luke M on March 31st, 2018. Over 225,000 views, almost 1,400 comments. User Grim Gaming TV leaves the most liked comment, posting, should have just let him build his damn road. It wasn't that simple, dummy. How about less gaming, more researching the stories you feel like commenting on? Congratulations, you're part of the biggest problem in society, the continual voicing of poorly fact check opinions. Right, that was another, I mean, there's so many fucking details. I could have added another two hours. You know, this, this little road thing he's referencing. You know, it has to do with like the easement and everything. <sighs> uh, going Coastal posts, the media downplayed this story because he might have humiliated the establishment. No, they didn't. He did not humiliate the establishment. He humiliated his family, right? By destroying a good chunk of a small town and then killing himself because he didn't get his way in a fucking zoning issue. Nick B. Creations posted, they pushed him so hard that he was prepared to sacrifice his own life just to get back against the people that destroyed his. The moment he lowered the armor on his tank, he was dedicated to go until the bitter end, go out in flames rather than die in the gutter. The system failed, not Marvin. Wrong answer, Nick. Marvin failed over and over. He could have walked away, as I've said so many times, with more money in his pocket than when he started. Right? He wasn't going to go into the fucking gutter. He, he, was, he had hundreds of thousands of dollars. No one destroyed his life. His life was fine. He, he could have went back to just snowmobiling and, and enjoying the great outdoors, but he chose to get in a ridiculous pissing contest. You know, he killed those, the, the town because he was a fucking nut who thought God had sent him, sent, you know, sent him to do all this to apparently flatten a former mayor's widow's home. Oh, he was a stubborn fool. Pong face, Bob face posted a government big enough to give you everything you want. Uh, is a government big enough to take everything you have? And he attributes this to Thomas Jefferson. This is infuriating. He wasn't fighting a big government. <laughs> they, could, they didn't take everything he had. It was a small town council of local volunteers, people about as powerful as the people at your local PTA board. Oh my God. Chris Hahn posts the 79 people that dislike this video must be the Granby City Council or their family members. Nope. Those 79 people, up to 111 when I clicked on this video, uh, now 112, including me, are the only reasonable people in the comment thread. AJ Sky posts, rest in peace, Marvin. You are our hero. You did what you had to do. No, he didn't. <laughs> no, he didn't. He could he could have walked away. God damn it. User literally God posts amazingly surreal. This man is absolutely a legend. He was a completely normal and reasonable man who was screwed over by big businesses and crooked politicians. What? Big businesses? You mean a local concrete maker who couldn't even afford to outbid him at a cheap-ass land auction? Literally every fucking comment I read in this thread is pro-Marvin. Every comment I saw in about five other videos threads, pro-Marvin. I want to build my killdozer and find the homes of the people in this comment section and raise them into rubble. But like Glenn Trainer pointed out, that wouldn't lead to anything good. Communication does, so please let me communicate. Uh, let, let, this, let this story be a cautionary tale uh, and, and let it also illuminate a real problem in society right now that people don't fucking research their opinions. Stop just seeing what you want to see. The story of Marvin Hemeyer is such an amazing example of how sometimes we just hear what we want to hear. Right? It, it feels like 99% of the people who hear the story are drawn to it because they want to hear a tale about a little guy, an underdog, somebody put upon, getting fucked over by the man, and then getting his revenge. Yeah! Going out in a blaze of glory! G going out in a justified vengeance rampage. And that would be a great story. But it's not Marvin Hemeyer's story. Marvin Hemeyer was not a hero. He was a disturbed child of a man. Things didn't go his way in one particular business situation, so he chose to physically attack an entire town like a fucking maniac. If his case was so righteous, why not let himself get arrested in the end? 
and continue to fight in the courtroom, right? Continue to rail against this, the, the, this, the powers that be, this corrupt system and prison interviews. He could write books from prison. He could be some kind of Nelson Mandela, you know, freedom figure. Use all that media coverage to push his godly agenda. But he didn't do that because he was a nut. He didn't have a leg to stand on. He was not a hero. Had he not killed himself and made himself a martyr, he'd just be another dumb shit in prison blaming everyone else for his own fuck-ups. Don't think well of Marvin. Be better than that. Pick a better hero. There's plenty out there. You can start with a guy who just shows up to work every day, as he said, a guy who did his best, uh, you know, to stop this, this maniac, a guy who risked his life, you know, climbing on top of his killdozer, Glenn Trainer. Idiots of the internet. So there you go. He Meyer, not an anti-government hero. And I don't think he would even say that if he was alive. I don't think he would claim to be one. His own sister says he was proud of his time in the Air Force, proud to pay his taxes, read books by Bill O'Reilly, loved action movies like Independence Day. His sister-in-law denounced Marvin as any kind of anti-government hero after his death, saying he was proud of his time in the Air Force. He loved the government. She said, quote, he wasn't anti-government at all. His problem was just a few people. No, his problem was with just a few people. So again, don't make him into something he wasn't. Uh, Something we didn't touch on in the interview was, where does the name Killdozer come from? Well, it doesn't come from Marvin Heemeyer. It comes from a 1944 sci-fi novella, 1974 made for sci-fi, or made for TV sci-fi movie of the same name, about a bulldozer that comes into contact with an alien consciousness that made it to Earth via meteorite. This is the novella. The bulldozer becomes sentient and starts killing people. Uh, The story was also adapted into a Marvel Comics World's Unknown issue, April of 74. Marvin uh, himself, to my knowledge, never called his bulldozer Killdozer. So it's uh, not likely this book or movie or comic book inspired him. Could have been inspired, though, by Sean Nelson, an American plumber and U.S. Army vet who, when he was 35, stole an M60A3 patent tank from a U.S. National Guard armory in San Diego and went on a rampage on May 17th, 1995, destroying cars, an RV, and more before and shot, be- and more before being shot and killed by a police officer. Why did he do it? Victim of a tyrannical government? Nope. Uh, Dude had health problems. Uh, Was the recent victim of some theft that took a lot of his uh, business operating equipment. Made it hard for him to work. His wife had recently left him. Then his uh, new girlfriend left him. His house fell into foreclosure. And he went crazy. He was a desperate man making a terrible, desperate decision. He wanted someone to blame for his shitty life before he died. And, uh, you know, he got into thinking that the real reason his life was in shambles was the U.S. government. He was also another anti-government dude. Week before he died, he told a friend that he was a big fan of Timothy McVeigh the Oklahoma City bomber, another misguided asshole. Um, Hemeyer was very likely inspired by another Colorado guy, Thomas Leesk, a part-time snowplow driver who went on a rampage with a stolen military surplus front end loader in the tiny town of Alma, population 150 back in 1998 when this happened. Uh, the highest altitude town in the uh, lower 48, at the very least, I think in the whole country. It's over 10,000 feet up in altitude. But uh, anyway, he shot a former mayor to death there, a man named Willie Morrison who is not some big government fat cat. This guy was running an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting in the town hall when Thomas killed him. He was also a talented metal sculptor who was just trying to, you know, or just starting to make it as a professional artist. Why did he do all this? Well, the 50-year-old lunatic uh, didn't like being forced to use the town's water system. So he drove around for over four hours and punched holes in four public buildings, knocked out water and phone service to everyone in town. He attacked the town hall, fire station, post office, and water treatment plant. In addition to working as a part-time snowplow driver, uh, Leesk also sold homemade audio tapes discussing his aggressive anti-government views. He was also a known alcoholic who uh, set his own home on fire and fled into the woods after his rampage was over. I wonder if everyone uh, thinks he's a hero. wonder if the internet uh, is in love with this guy as well. Probably, gosh dang. Okay, let's get out of here. Let's go to top five takeaways. Time suck. Top five takeaways. Takeaway number one, Marvin Heemeyer sold the property that idiots online think ruined his life for $550,000. He bought it for $42,000. After dumping money into it, he still netted over $400,000 in the sale. Also ran a profitable business at that location for a decade. So uh, exactly how did the town of Granby, as many on the web claim, quote, ruin his life? Uh Uh-huh. Cool story, bro. Number two, dude, not a hero. Have I said that enough? Maybe like a hundred times now? I'm only beating that drum because it seems like hundreds of thousands of people online are beating the he is a hero drum. 
Nope, he risked the lives of numerous innocents, as you heard for yourself, attacked police officers several times with intent to kill. Maybe he was a nice guy most of the time. Maybe he tried to do the right thing most of the time, and maybe he believed he was really doing God's work, but fuck that dude. Number three, volunteer politicians. Town of less than 2,000 people. He did not fight the man. He fought some small town folk about as politically powerful as your local Cub Scout troop leader. Number four, Marvin may have been inspired by an incident that happened in Alma just a few years before his outburst of spiritually misguided vengeance. It turns out anyone can turn an automobile into a weapon. Uh, terrifying thought. Number five, new info. People are still intentionally smashing buildings with giant vehicles. A man in Russia, in just, uh, just last year, 2018, rammed a stolen tank into a supermarket before climbing to the rubble to steal a bottle of wine, which I think is pretty funny, actually. The armored vehicle uh, was taken from a motorsport training grant ground nearby before the man drove it through a forest and into Apatiti or uh, Apatiti, a small city that's hard for me to say, uh, just south of the Arctic Circle. Struggling to turn around in the narrow street, the man whom witnesses say seemed drunk proceeded to slam the tank into the convenience store's window. He also crushed a car parked nearby. Footage shared on social media shows the man sub subsequently got out of the vehicle through its hatch, briefly inspected the damage, went into the shop through a broken window. He was later arrested in possession of a stolen bottle of wine, why did he do it? Well, because the shop was not licensed to sell alcohol that early in the morning, and he wanted some alcohol. The man in his late 20s did not resist arrest. Time suck. Top five takeaways. Another week, another topic sucks. This one got me a lot more fired up than most. Every Monday now, for over three years, another topic. I'm, I'm proud of that. Uh, big thanks again to Glenn Trainer, former Grand County Undersheriff, current Chief of Police for the towns of Fraser and Winter Park, Colorado. Thanks to your daughter, Jordan, not Sydney. I will lash myself more when we're done here. Uh, thanks to the Time Suck team, Queen of the Suck, Lindsay Cummins, High Priest of the Suck, Harmony Vela Camp, Reverend Dr. Joe Paisley. Thanks to the Bit Elixir app design crew. Thanks to Kate and Logan at Spicy Club, formerly known as Access Apparel, running that Cyber Monday sale right now. Got those robes back in. Big thanks to the script keeper, Zach Flannery. Link to both the private Facebook group and Discord in the episode description if you want to meet and converse with more Time Suckers. Those groups keep growing. Thank you, Nimrod, for that. Next week on Time Suck, going in a very different direction, going to focus on a man who, along with artist Jack Kirby, brought us some of the most important superheroes that live in the collective conscious today. His name was Stan Lee. Stan Lee, born Stan Stanley. Martin Lieber, a New York City to Romanian immigrant parents in late 1922. Raised during the Depression, Lieber's parents struggled to make ends meet. Stan was shortened his name to Lee, went on to be hired as an office assistant at Timely Comics in 1939, became an interim editor for the company in the early 40s, and the company would morph into the powerhouse known as Marvel Comics. Much better name than Timely. Lee would also serve domestically in the Army during World War II as a writer and illustrator. In the early 60s at Marvel, Lee was called upon to create a series to compete with DC Comics' hit The Justice League of America. The result was the Fantastic Four that he and Kirby co-created. After the success of the Fantastic Four, a slew of new characters soon sprung from Lee and his Marvel cohorts, including the Hulk, Spider-Man, Doctor Strange, Daredevil, the X-Men, and more. Marvel Comics became a highly popular franchise, and Stan Lee was promoted to editorial director and publisher in 1972. And his characters were turned into international blockbuster films like the Iron Man movies, the X-Men film franchise, and the number one, number five, and number eight highest grossing movies of all time, the Avengers franchise. This suck gives us a chance to humanize this superhuman legend from his almost, uh, from his almost 70 year marriage to his wife, Joan, to receiving a medal of arts honor from president George W. Bush to the legal battles. Yes, there was controversies with him as well and his diverse entertainment adventures. We will have one epic suck on one of history's most epic storytellers. And that's next week on Time Suck. And now let's move on over to today's Time Sucker updates. Updates. Get your Time Sucker updates. We, we got a crazy Richard the Night Stalker Ramirez update to kick things off. Time Sucker Mark Pearson writes, Dear Lord Master Sucker, please forgive this for being long, but it will be worth it. I promise. So I'm sitting here the day after Thanksgiving with my girlfriend. We're watching TV, and she changed the channel to a true crime show about Elisa Lamb and her death at the Cecil Hotel. As she changed the channel, she asked me, what is this about? And I quickly explained because I have listened to the Richard Ramirez suck and the Elisa Lamb suck, and I looked up the YouTube video of Elisa Lamb in the elevator. At this time, the show starts showing shots of the Cecil Hotel, and my girlfriend says, hey, my dad used to work there, and my family lived there when I was born. 
I looked at her with obvious doubt and she repeated that it was true and that a man there once tried to rape my mom. I immediately picked up my phone, looked up Richard Ramirez and the dates of his murders and his murder started less than two weeks after my girlfriend was born. So she then freaked out and called her mom. Now her mom immigrated from El Salvador and her dad from Mexico and they don't speak good English. So I'm listening to this call as best I can since I know a little Spanish. As she is talking to her parents on the phone, she first asked where they lived and where when she was born. And her mom clearly says Cecil Hotel. She then asked how long her dad worked there. And he said from 1980 to 1990. Then she asked, did someone there try to rape you, mom? Was he Hispanic or black? And her mom replied, oh, he was Hispanic. His name was Richard Ramirez. That's fucking crazy. I immediately flipped the fuck out in shock while her mom kept talking. Her mom went on to further explain that she was able to get away from Ramirez and escape and shortly after moved out. In the background, her dad says, I knew Richard Ramirez. I would talk to him. Eeh. They both told us this super casually like it's no big deal while me and my girlfriend are freaking out. After she hung up the phone, my girlfriend then told me when she was little, they would take lunch to her dad while he was at work and the hotel had rats the size of cats. I'm still reeling from all this. I'm really thankful to say that her family moved out of that environment and now live in a much better place. And my girlfriend now is an accountant for an oil company in Houston. So they made their lives better. My girlfriend has told me many times that she lived in a bad part of LA growing up, but holy shit, I didn't think she grew up in proximity to Richard Ramirez. Thanks for reading. Hail Nimrod, Mark. Well, thank you, Mark. That was worth it, man. Yeah, your girlfriend lives in a real bad part of LA. The Cecil Hotel in the 80s, downtown LA, about as bad as it got. Man, crazy your parents knew Richard Ramirez. Not surprised uh, to hear that he tried to rape your girlfriend's mom. Dude was evil. So glad to hear your girlfriend is kicking ass now, man. Oil company accountant. I'm, I'm guessing that pays all right. That's some rags to riches shit. I love it. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, quick shout out now to Haley Morris. Dan Morris, time sucker, wrote in letting us know it was your birthday on the 6th, Haley. So happy birthday. On the uh, December 6th, it was great meeting both of you in Portland. Hope your Thanksgiving was awesome. Hail Nimrod to both of you. Now an inspiring update and shout-out request coming in from Space Wizard Rocco Ames. Rocco writes, loyal Space Wizard Rocco Ames here again. Hello to the team, by the way. Anyway, I too was adopted. This is referring, of course, to last week's David Berkowitz. Suck. Uh, the uh, son of Sam. I found out right after my first deployment to Iraq, 2006, 2007, and 2008. My mother was hesitant to tell me because my biological mother abandoned me in the hospital as I was very premature and my father bailed too. He's the one I mentioned in previous messages read on the suck about all the ghost shows he's filmed here in Fort Wayne. My adoptive father was an awesome Vietnam vet and my adoptive mother was the absolute shit. They were wonderful people and their kindness and compassion for an abandoned little guy made me the man I am today. And because I lost my father so young, I joined the army to emulate him. Oh, that's amazing. I witnessed my father die of a heart attack while I was nine, and I tried to give him CPR on a rainy highway two days before Christmas. Shit. I didn't piss and moan and run around murdering people, and my story is way worse than that human scrot, Berkowitz. Give a shout out to the ever-mentioned space or trucker, Gary Howard, for me. I got, him, I got him into Time Suck, and in return, he made me a space lizard. Gary was with me during Operation Iraqi Freedom, so the bond goes far beyond the suck. Hail Nimrod. Uh, well, thank you, Rocco, for your service. Thank you for working hard to overcome what you over overcame. And, uh, you know, he became a productive member of society. Uh, awesome veteran. You didn't end up being a murdering psychopath. Hail Nimrod to you. And thank, uh, you know, Gary Howard as well for your service. Thank you, Gary. Thanks for spreading this suck. Uh, thanks for spreading it to Gary. Hail Nimrod to you as well. Uh, finally, a new uh, Time Suck based term has been sent our way by Time Sucker Eric Walsh. And it's pretty adorable. And I want to share it. Eric writes, here come the babies, mother sucker. Lord of the suck, I'm writing because my girlfriend and I just found out we'll be having a meatball. What I believe should be the new term for a tiny meat sack. I love it. The timing is unexpected and far from ideal, but sometimes Nimrod's will, uh, sometimes Nimrod wills things out of our control. While we were doing everything we could to avoid it, Lucifina decided that our passion was too strong not to produce an offspring Bojangles would be proud of. That said, as any meat sack parents would know, pregnancy is hard, particularly first. My girlfriend is as uh, hardworking, as strong as any woman you will ever meet and is more headstrong than I can ever hope to be, but the early stages of the pregnancy are really testing her. She has gotten the absolute worst of all the symptoms and is really struggling to find the positive. 
as a huge believer in mind over matter, I think a shout out from the suck master himself would go a long way. Her name is Clarissa and she is dedicated. She's a dedicated member of the cult of curious. Her and I are both topic suggestors too. animal rights, welfare, ethics, gypsy rose. So get on those. I go by Nashville for the sake of the suck, but it would mean a lot to, uh, to know that Bubba is here for her. I mean a lot to her. Oh, keep on sucking. Uh, FYI, did you realize Veterans Day was also Polish Independence Day, a.k.a. the day the Soviet Union thought to itself, what's this big deal with Poland? These people too dirty, even for gulags. Meatball, I love it. Thank you, Eric. And I hope you're feeling better, Clarissa. Yeah, po be positive. You know, I remember when I was pre pregnant, uh, it didn't even fucking bother me one bit. So, you know, stop being a crybaby. Stop whining about it. Whatever, just push it out. Fucking move on. Kidding! JK! JK! I know I don't know how it feels. I know uh, it's probably worse than anything I can imagine. But sound like you got some good support. Uh, hopefully you, you got some good, uh, whatever kind of painkillers you're allowed to take during the pregnancy. Um, I know just talking to people who've been pregnant again, I feel like weird even saying anything about this as a dude, <laughs> but I know that like there's classes and things that have helped other people, support groups, all that kind of stuff uh, for, for pregnant women struggling with it. Obviously, I can't offer any more than that because uh, I've never tried pushing the baby out my wean, you know, which I'm pretty sure is not possible. Hope not. It sounds rough. But, but I hope, I hope at least this made you laugh. And uh, I hope you guys are excited about your little meatball. Adorable term. I love it so much. <laughs> and I uh, thank you both for listening and being involved. And, and again, congrats. Right? I hope you raise your little meatball to be a curious, critically thinking, contributing member of society who speaks more clearly than I do. Uh, I hope you teach him or her to have fucking fun, you know, as well. Not take the world too seriously. And thanks for the information about Poland. Uh, gross. Ugh. I'll be sure and tell Lindsay that her birthday, November 11th, is also, uh, you know, apparently Polish Independence Day. I'm, I'm sure she doesn't know because those filthy fucking Polish people don't give a shit about their dirty history. And keep on sucking. Thanks, time suckers. I needed that. We all did. Have a great week, everybody. If you end up getting caught up in some kind of property dispute, uh, please, please don't throw your life away. And, uh, you know, go on an insane, fortified bulldozer rampage. And also, uh, uh, keep on sucking. Uh, keep on sucking if you don't, you don't mind. Oh,